Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. The world is a vampire. Sent to drain. Secret destroyers. Hold you up to the flame. And what do I get? <laughs> For my pain. Betray desires. And a piece of the game. Just the chorus. <gasps> Despite all my rage, I am still just a vampire in a cage. Oh yeah. Or I kept going. a werewolf. Or a werewolf, but probably a vampire. Yeah. It was a werewolf a month ago. Kessig cage breakers. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everyone? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm one of your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Wow, that song took me back to high school, Jimmy. Yeah, that one Dating took me back to, bit. yeah, the end of high school. There you go. That's how I date myself. <laughs> uh, we're talking about the new commanders from Val, Crimson Val. It's the second half of the Midnight Hunt Crimson Val in the Strahd series. Uh, they jam-packed two sets into the fall this year. Uh, yeah, much into to like our delight. seven weeks or something. Woohoo! There was like a short period. We got some good episodes in about other stuff. We got to meet the uh, other people at the office office here but we're right back into the set reviews um and we're talking about the multicolored commanders this time around yep multicolored commanders set review you know the deal before we get into it though mm -hmm. there is some really cool stuff in here uh if you want to get your hands on it channelfireball.com slash command do it that is the place to go they've got their brand new marketplace up and running they gave a bunch of stuff away last month for their first month sort of their launch uh spectacular but Still, the, the marketplace is the best place to go to get all your cards because now they've got hundreds of vendors on there all vying for your business, which means all the prices are getting pushed very, very low. The mm -hmm. inventory is very high. You can get great deals on there. And if you need magic cards, you're going to get these magic cards anyway. Yep. Just go to channelfireball.com slash command when you buy them and you'll be simultaneously supporting all of our content. Or use the promo code command at checkout. And don't forget, this is the way to support local game stores above buying them from random people around the world because LGSs are certified sellers and they're verified and they're going to be working on the marketplace so uh it's a great way to get your uh dollars out there to people that deserve it um and then when you get your cards back from the marketplace you want to make yeah. sure you protect it and the company that Jim, jimmy and i trust our own collections uh two is ultra pro they really do make the best stuff to protect all your game pieces i wanted to show off something really cool here that they they showed to us recently they've started making these deck boxes uh that have like a leather finish to them. Yeah, they're really nice. Yeah, and then they have some of the, I think this is the showcase art yep. uh, from the set. And, you know, they've got super strong magnets. In fact, there we go. I opened it. Jeez. Those um, forearms can't even open yeah. this. They must be strong. Uh, and they're really high high uh, quality and really classy looking. Um, we're going to put the digital image on screen if you're watching on YouTube. This is something sort of new that Ultra Pro is doing. And yeah, they're always really upping cool. their game, which is one of the things that, uh, that we love about Ultra Pro. Yeah, it's the way to actually bring the full flavor all the way around. I know so many people love to have the sleeves, the play mats, and Ultra Pro has the art, the official art every single time, so you can really show up in style and protect your cards at the same time. Yeah, if you build an Olivia deck, putting it in the Olivia deck box is a must. Pretty cool. Or any kind of vampire deck. Yeah, and the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. Patrons get all kinds of perks, like watching extra turns and game nights earlier than the general public. Ad free. They also get to uh, interact with Jimmy and I on our Discord every day, and also we shout out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to... to Gavin Galitsky. Gavin. Gavin. You rock. Bingo. That is a superhero name, Gavin yeah. Galitsky. GG, Gavin Galitsky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get right into it. Now, we're not covering the multicolored commanders from the commander product. Mm. There are going to be different videos. We're going to do a deck preview, I believe, of one of them as well. So we'll talk about those later. Uh, but before we dive into the actual commanders, let's talk about the new mechanics in the set. Um, the first one doesn't appear on any of the cards that we're talking about today. So we'll talk about more during the 99 card set review in the 99. It's called Cleave. It's an interesting sort of a kicker type cost. It's an additional cost you may pay, or sorry, an alternate cost you may pay when you're casting the spell. And if you do, you remove the words in the rules text that are in square brackets. This is a very strange sort of new way to, to make a spell have two modes almost. You can cast it for its normal side and you read all the words. And if you cast it for its cleave cost, you just cleave those words off it. For example, we're going to put it on screen here. It's called Dig Up. Pretty good card. Yeah, it's one green for a sorcery. It says, search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. 
but it has a cleave cost of one black, black, and green. So four mana if you want to cleave it. But the words basic land and reveal it are in square brackets. So if you pay the cleave cost, it actually says this. Search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So it becomes wow. Diabolic Tutor or Demonic Tutor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for four mana, it's diabol- close to Diabolic. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit worse than Diabolic, obviously, because you have a little green thrown in there that you have to have. Mm-hmm. But also... Be- Diabolic Tutor does not have a second mode that just lets you search for a basic land card. Yeah. Um, so it, it might be better than Diabolic Tutor. I think it probably is. Cleave gives you a little bit of um, flexibility, some modality mm-hmm. to the card. So it's yeah. kind of another way to do different modes on a card with different costs. It's pretty cool. You can just get a basic land in the early game if you need it, or later on, draw it later on. Four mana, tutor up whatever you need. So that seems pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, the next m- new mechanic is called Training. Uh, training is a mechanic that is very combat focused. So it says, Training, whenever this creature attacks with another creature with greater power, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature so the idea being if you have a 1-1 going into battle with the 2-2 the 1-1 with training is going to level up because the 2-2 is teaching them how to battle i guess and it gets a plus one plus one counter yeah a good example of this is a card called apprentice sharpshooter from the set um it's a 1-4 for a two and a green with reach and training and this is similar to mentor yeah a little bit yeah, yeah. Uh, except for that it the creature that has the training is getting bigger rather right. than making other creatures bigger. So Yeah, it's the which, train, the one getting trained, not the trainer. Trainee, not the trainer. <laughs> there you right, go, yeah, right, yeah. Right. Uh, and then the last sort of new mechanic in the set is not technically a new mechanic, but it's a new token type. Uh, they're blood tokens. Blood. So this is the vampire set. Not surprising that they make blood tokens. <laughs> um, blood tokens read, um, it's an artifact with one tap the blood token, discard a card, and then sacrifice the blood token, and you draw a card. So a lot of cost, right? You got to pay a mana, you got to discard a card, and sack the artifact Mm -hmm. to draw a card. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about blood tokens later. It's red's uh, rummaging, so they discard, then draw, instead of looting, which is draw, then discard. Rummaging is a little bit worse, uh, and it has a one mana uh, cost on top. This is similar to, like, clue tokens and stuff in the past, which are, these are ways to get card advantage Maybe. You got to jump through some hoops. Yeah, you got to jump through hoops. Yeah. Then there are a bunch of returning mechanics. Uh, That was all the new mechanics from the set. And uh, not super complicated, which is Mm -hmm. good because, you know, as we're going to see with returning mechanics, there were some complicated ones in the last set. (laughs) Uh, So returning mechanics, the daybound, nightbound mechanic is back. Um, The transform mechanic in general is back. A lot of vampires transform. Oh, yeah, vampires too. (laughs) Yeah. Day, night. uh, The day, night thing is a little bit complicated we're not going to go all over, over all the rules here if you go to our episode uh 420 um we we go into how daybound nightbound works in depth so you can check that out if you're still confused which honestly i still am sometimes yeah and it's something that you won't see it too much but you should know how it works because when it comes up in the game it will be there for the rest of the game and there's certainly times when you're like wait how does this work i'm not sure let's look it up yeah uh the next returning mechanic is disturb this is basically an alternate cost on the bottom of the cards typically that allow you to cast the card from your graveyard transformed so it, it dies and then it becomes disturbed out of the graveyard and it flips on this backside typically after after that creature dies, then it gets exiled. Uh, curses are back. So we saw Lindy from the, the last set mm-hmm. in the set boosters was a cursed deck, and they've brought some curses back in this set. Nothing we're going to talk about today, but that is back. And, and then, then finally, yeah, yeah, this is one I didn't necessarily expect to come back. Exploit. This came all the way from Tarkir, the uh, the Dragons of Tarkir, one of the Tarkir sets. Yeah, I believe it was. Uh, and it's when the creature enters the battlefield, you exploit it. So you can sacrifice a creature, including itself, to get an additional ability. Yep, you don't have to. It's a May. Yeah, it's a May. Again, won't necessarily come into effect on this episode. Okay, let's dive into the multicolored commanders here. We're going to do them in alphabetical order. Yeah. Again, as Jimmy said, we are not going to talk about the commanders from the commander products because at the time this episode releases, those will not be known to the world yet. Correct. Uh, we've seen them, though. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. First up, we got Anya, Maid of Dishonor. And for all these, like, sort of the big cards that are a bunch of alternate arts as well, sort of the new showcase frames and the specific ones that they do for the set. So we'll try and show those on screen when we have it. Uh, Anya made of dishonor is two a black and a red for a legendary creature vampire that's a four five whenever anya and or one or more other vampires enter the battlefield under your control create a blood token this ability triggers only once each turn and again blood tokens are artifacts with pay with one mana tap discarded card sacrifice this artifact to then draw a card and you can pay two mana on anya to sacrifice another creature or a blood token and you get the effect that each opponent loses two life and you gain two life a lot going on here and especially with the blood tokens themselves being kind of complicated it's not like a clue where it's just like pay this do this yeah it's yeah. like it's like pay this discard a card sack it now yeah, draw your this. card yeah yeah um 
on Anya, Anya. Uh, I think we never figured out exactly how to play. Let's say Anya. Anya. Let's just say Anya. Yeah, Anya's good. Okay. Um, it does say ability triggers only once each turn, mm -hmm. which kind of I think caps it a little bit as to how powerful it can be. You cannot go infinite with Anya. Anya, you um, yeah. you know, you can't like cast the same vampire over and over somehow, bounce back to your hand and get infinite tokens. It does say each turn, though. Right. So it could happen four times around the turn cycle. Which, you know, I think is easy to overlook. Uh, s somebody here mentioned that, like, because of the way that it's worded, Anya doesn't work particularly well, even with, like, something like Edgar, right? Because right. you would cast your first vampire, get a blood token, get a 1-1 one, one. One from Edgar, but the 1-1 one, one coming in doesn't give you another blood token because it only triggers once each turn. I think there are some niche... Um, uses Things. where it would work with edgar right like if you cast a non-creature vampire with oh edgar. right so there are cards that have shapeshifter on them or ch and changeling so this card is a creature type they're instant so nameless inversion is a classic uh and it's just a it gives a creature plus three minus three and loses all creature types but that's a tribal instant shapeshifter changeling so that's an instant you would cast it and then the one moment come in edgar would make a one one and now that one one being the first <laughs> vampire that's entered this turn would make you a blood token. I mean, that's a lot of humps, ho hoops to jump through to make Anya work in an Edgar deck. Uh, as far as an Anya deck by itself, I think you probably want as many ways to get vampires into play at instant speed as possible so you can take advantage of making more blood tokens. So you can make one on your turn yeah. and then be able to do at least one or two on your opponent's turn so you can get those extra blood tokens. Uh, so there are some instant speed vampires. There is Blood Crazed Paladin, Yep, this is from Ixalan. It's just a one in a black flash vampire knight. And then it enters with more plus and plus counters for each creature that died. Uh, there's also a commander card that we weren't super high on, but it does have flash on it. It's a vampire. It's bold plagiarist. Uh, this is just a way to get more of those counters on blood plagiarist, but it's not bold plagiarist. It's not a great card, but it is a way to trigger Anya on someone else's turn. Yep. But even then, just getting a blood token each time is a little underwhelming. So I'm not very impressed with this so far. There are other ways to get vampires out at instant speed, though. Yeah, Vodalkanori, Winding Canyons, that will make the regular vampires have flash. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's interesting is there are madness synergies, because madness does allow right. you to play vampires at flash speed. So let's say you had, like, the Stormkirk Occultist, which is two and a red for a 3-2 vampire. I won't read the text, but it has madness, which says if you discard this card, discard it into exile. When you do, cast it for its madness cost or put it into the graveyard. Ah, so nice. this ignores timing restrictions. And the interesting thing about blood tokens are that they require you to discard a card. Mm. So I think that's where the synergy lies here, right? You play a vampire on your turn, you make a blood token. Then on Jimmy's turn, you activate the blood token for one mana. Sack it. Sack it, discard, discard a, card. a card, discard a card with madness, cast it. Now it enters the blood the, the battlefield and creates a blood token because right. it is now the first vampire that's entered the battlefield this turn. And that way you're actually drawing a real card because when you're discarding the card, it's not going to the graveyard. You yeah. can actually cast it. Um, Falcon Wrath Gorger is also a card that says each vampire creature card you own that isn't on the battlefield has madness. So that seems like probably one of the best cards in the deck just to be able to let you go through the deck like that. Yeah, so it feels like madness tribal is probably the way you're going to go here. And, and that kind of begs the question of how this compares to the original Anya, which was a few, <laughs> few years ago in the Commander product, which is also a Madness deck, right? Yeah. You played this deck. It's also a CEDH deck yeah. uh, because it, it's, it's a three-man commander with haste to tap a discarded card, draw a card, and it doesn't require you to sacrifice a creature right. or an artifact or anything or pay any mana. And then whenever you discard a card, if it has Madness, you get to untap Anya. So this original version is far better than Anya Made of Dishonor. It's a cheaper mana cost. You can use it instantly when it comes into the battlefield. You don't need to wait to have blood token synergies and pay mana for that. You can use it over and over again. If you exactly. spend together like three or four mana cards, just keep going, it keeps yeah. on tapping And you don't Anya. actually have to cast the madness cards with Anya too. You can just discard to draw another card, discard to draw another card. So it's a way to like sift through your deck and get to answers really quickly. The one thing I'll say is that the original Anya doesn't care about vampires. It just cares about madness. Right. Whereas the new Anya cares about vampires. So now it allows you to make a vampire focused uh, madness deck, although I think you're correct. Undoubtedly, it will not be as powerful, but that's fine. Like, most yeah. people aren't trying to make competitive EDH decks anyway. No, and it, look, if you play either of the Anyas, if the other one goes into that deck pretty well. Probably, so. yeah. Um, the next uh, point here is creatures or blood. So you'll notice that Anya's second ability is you pay to sacrifice another creature or a blood token, and then each opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. So a 
potential win con in this deck is get enough blood tokens and then enough mana and just sack a ton sack of them. them all, yeah, because yeah, if you stack 20 of them, well, that's going to be 40 life yeah. <laughs> to everybody. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of mana, but, you know, commander decks do things like that. So that's not crazy. Um, I wanted to note that there are only 23 cards in the main set. And this is the only set blood tokens have existed in yet. Yep. Uh, it, only it may be the only set. Maybe the only set ever, or at least for a long time. 23 cards in the main set that are in black or red, mm -hmm. so it could go in an Anya deck, uh, that create blood tokens. Now, there are command. there's a commander products coming out. We know one of them is black and red, so it's possible there's a few more blood token creators. Yeah. But remember, that's in the history of magic. So, so the, they're not all going to be good. A lot of them are going to be like, you know... Commons, uncommons, draft playable. Yeah, so stuff. how many of those are like commander level power powerful yeah. right like most of the supported archetypes we want to play in commander have hundreds of cards over the years that like mm -hmm. plus one plus one counters there are thousands oh, yeah. of cards that care about that right so it feels like it's gonna be hard to to make the blood token part of it like really really important and you're probably gonna be sacrificing creatures definitely and aristocrats this is basically the exact same strategy and of course you have you know two mana to sack a creature and drain two gain two that's pretty good that's actually not bad. Aristocrats for sure adds up. And we've seen with um, uh, some cards like the uh, Comball, Console yeah. Allocation, just how quickly that damage can add up to make a big difference in the game. Yeah, and I think if you ever get infinite mana... Um you win. With Anya, yeah, I mean, it's not hard, but, like, reassembling Skeleton will do it, right? Just keep bringing it out, sacking it, yeah. bringing it out, sacking it. Something like Gravecrawler. There's a ton of stuff that will do that. Again, like you said, uh, Aristocrats decks already do this with Blood Artists and Zulaport Cutthroat, so, so I don't know how important it is to have Anya, but that's that's probably a, that's a probable win con for a deck yeah. like this, I would say, yeah. This deck doesn't seem too exciting, but it definitely has ways to play in a couple of different directions. So if you do decide to build it, you could go the Vampire route, you can go the Token route, you can go madness. the Blood Token route, you can go the Madness route, you can go the Creature route. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to take it um black and red though has had plenty of great options over the last year so anya is definitely facing a lot of competition in terms of true, a lot what of you want to build stuff are so cool yeah right? exactly uh i wanted to before we move on to the next one i just had wanted to ask a question that's related to anya but will also be related to some of the other ones which is blood tokens mm -hmm. day one discard a card sacrifice the blood token and tap draw it. a card yeah and have to tap it so you couldn't have tapped it for something else how good are blood tokens just as a thing if you don't have a lot of synergies built in Probably not that great. We've seen a lot of creatures in Magic's history like Goblin, Rummager types that just do this for tapping and don't need to sack itself and you can do it every single turn. You don't play them very often unless you have a lot of flashback cards or things you want to put into your bin. Um, now, black and red doesn't, no, red doesn't have as many options for card draws, so they typically do have to rummage, but black has plenty of options. Yeah, and I feel like red these days, it, we're not even saying that that much anymore. Yeah. White needs card draw, but red seems just perfectly fine. Yeah, and they have yeah. a lot of exile play yeah. off the top of your library, so there's there's lots of options that red has. I think it's, it's one of those things that works really nicely in the set, and there's going to be some cool strategies, and it's going to be cute. I, I use that word not in like a derogatory way, but just like, it's a fun, like, oh, cool. That was neat that you did that. I'm going to play this and really take over the game now. So I think blood tokens are, uh, on, in terms of like being on the road to, the vic to your victory, they're pretty low on that scale. Yeah, I would say there's like a hierarchy. Treasure tokens, yeah, very sure. high, right? Uh, I'm willing to go out of my way to get treasure tokens. Clue tokens, pretty high. They're just card advantage. They cost mm -hmm. some mana. Food, Food tokens, tokens, pretty low. Pretty low. They don't do a lot for you in the game. If you can't use them in other ways, you don't care about them that much um, outside of a dedicated food token strategy. And I think blood tokens are like food tokens where like... Yeah, right around the same. Yeah, you, you need blood token payoffs or something like that. You're not just like playing cards that give you blood tokens just for the value of having blood tokens. Yeah, I think there are more discard synergies and creator synergies than there are life gain ones. So the food tokens, I think, are actually on the lowest part of the oh, tier list. Yeah, that so might be right. Blood tokens are a little higher. Okay, let's move on to the next commander. I will read it. It is Dorothea, Vengeful Victim. Cost just a blue and a white for a 4-4 four, four flying legendary spirit. Whoa! Two mana, 4-4 four, four flyer. But it I says... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't start celebrating quite yet. It says, when Dorothea attacks or blocks, sacrifice it at the end of combat. Aha. So that's not great, except for Dorothea does have Disturb. So you can cast it from your graveyard transformed for one, a white, and a blue. Okay. And it transforms into Dorothea's Retribution, which is an enchantment aura. Ah. Uh, it's an enchant creature. It says enchanted creature has, whenever this creature attacks, create a 4-4 white spirit creature token with flying that's tapped and attacking. Sacrifice that token at the end of combat. If Dorothea's Retribution would be put into your graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. 
Okay. So there's a very famous card that this is very similar to. Geist of Saint Traft. Uh, one of the first decks I ever played against in Commander. And yeah, because Kessler has it. Yeah, Kessler has it, yeah. And I thought that Geist was not that overwhelmingly good. Uh, Geist creates an angel that you have to exile at the end of combat. Geist also has Hexproof. Dorothea does not. But Dorothea by itself, just a two-mana 4-4 four, four that can swing in on turn three and hit someone for a lot, is actually not bad but it does have to get sacrificed immediately that part's kind of bad because yeah. then you're changing your strategy totally right it's not like to, you're gonna commander yeah, exactly. damage somebody out because the aura won't be dealing damage so it won't do combat damage yeah the backside is really similar to invocation of saint Traft, but it, you know again it's it's a sacrifice token instead of exiling it but there's really nothing in white and blue that cares about you sacrificing permanence you'd have to go to like thraxamundar type decks to care about when you sacrifice stuff so that doesn't make a huge difference here so i think if you're building this deck the main thing is just ending the turn effects are really good because it lets you keep the tokens that you make or the dorothea herself uh, and so sundial of the infinite is pretty good here you can just use it when the trigger's on the stack get rid of everything when the uh, exile trigger when the exile yeah, triggers on the stack yeah so, so how this works is you make the token when you attack the four mm -hmm. four angel and then it says sacrifice that token at end of combat so it would go to end of combat it Ooh, would trigger. The trigger on the stack would say hey you gotta you gotta sacrifice this thing and then you would send out the infinite or some other end the turn effect and then you end the turn and all those triggers and anything on the stack goes away so you keep that token forever yeah. it's a little bit awkward because you have to do that at end of combat yeah you don't get you, a second main phase yeah you gotta you gotta do everything on your main phase or just hold up responses or things like that you i wanted to say something about dorothea too that's awkward um when she flips or he when it flips you have to have a target for the enchantment aura oh right yeah, whereas you geist you just have a geist and it just does its thing and it's all self-contained yeah you need another creature otherwise and i'm uh, we should check this do you have to attach this to an opponent's creature if <laughs> if you don't have a, a legal target or can you just choose i guess i guess you're going to disturb it yeah so you're choosing when it happens but let's say you have one creature on the battlefield and you do this this goes on the stack and they go kill your creature your one creature yeah. what do you have to do there well you have to recast dorothea from your command zone yeah that that part I'd, I'd say is actually kind of a big downside of the card it's like just to get your game plan online you can't just flip this thing you need a target for the thing when it gets flipped yeah so if you're going for the dorothea smack face route you could like ghostly flicker or ephemerate it and so you always have it come back uh, but that doesn't seem great um and it, this is the kind of card that won't work with a card like Reconnaissance because Reconnaissance doesn't actually get a creature out of combat. It's like a, it's a delayed trigger, so it doesn't care if you take it out of combat at the end. So I think you're just going to put this in the 99 of some decks. I don't think this is an amazing uh, commander by itself. A lot of people mentioned Ineaz the Gale Force. So this is a flyer that's five mana. It's white blue as well. And it says, whenever three or more creatures you control with flying attack, each player gains control of a non-land permanent of your choice controlled by the player to their right. So this is actually pretty cool with Dorothea because you can have it out, you can uh, swing with it, and then when you swing with three or more creatures and it has flying, you can give people Dorothea. And at the end of combat, it sacrifices so they don't actually get it. It goes to your graveyard. And when you have Dorothea's Retribution out, you can give them the angel that, or the spirit that it creates, and then at the end of combat, it sacrifices so they don't get it. So you can always have something free to give people. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a deck here that is sort of like the aggro blue white flyers deck you want to throw enchantment auras like dorothea's retribution or aqueous form of and i this is sort of based off that mono blue deck that was big and standard a few years back um so get like unblockable stuff and get the dorothea's retribution onto that so you can just keep attacking over yeah over. stick it on a blighted agent uh or a tetsuko umazawa and just always be able to get in for damage i think that, i mean four in the air adds up quickly but the problem is that it's a very fragile strategy but you're in white blue so you can probably do some stasis -y type things or lockdowns or counters. It's not very exciting. It's a very basic sort of deck, I think, where it's just like fly over them, hit them a bunch, and your creatures are hard to block. Yeah, I would say if you're building this deck, look at the Geis of St. Traft stuff on EDH Rec, and that's going to give you a good roadmap of the type of stuff you would want to use. But on the other hand, like this just seems like a lot worse than Geist and not not opening up a lot of doors that guys doesn't already have open yeah the not hexproof thing is huge because you can't voltron up the thing because yep. they can just easily kill it and it's not like guys of saint traft is like a really expensive card it's like two dollars so yeah yeah if, if this excites you i would encourage you to look into guys of saint traft because I, I think it's probably just going to be a, a lot better and more stable than dorothea all right let's talk about the next one <laughs> which is dracula we should say that um there are reskinned versions of some of the cards in this set into the world of dracula mm -hmm. and this is reskinned similar to how they did the godzilla stuff in uh ikoria yeah where 
it will say like the name, the the Dracula name of the card, and then under that it'll say the magic name, and these are considered the same card. So you can't have Dracula in this deck, but it could be, or you can't have Edgar, it's Edgar, right. um, in the Dracula deck. They are the same card. But anyway, just gives you some cool options for bling, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can make a whole vampire Dracula deck now. But this is Edgar, Charmed Groom. He doesn't look too young to be a groom these days. Two a white and a black for a vampire noble, legendary creature. It's a 4-4. Other vampires you control get plus one, plus one. And when Edgar dies, return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. And this is a fun one. It transforms into Edgar Markov's coffin, a legendary artifact. He turns into his coffin? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Vampires are, they're wilding out these days. <laughs> uh, this says, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one white and black vampire creature token with lifelink and put a bloodline counter on Edgar Markov's coffin. Then, if there are three or more bloodline counters on it, remove those counters and transform it. So he rises again out of the coffin. And becomes his 4-4 four, 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 four self that gives an anthem to all vampires. Yeah, this is... Underwhelming. Underwhelming, yeah, not seems, very exciting. It seems inefficient. It's four mana for give all your vampires plus one plus one on a four four and i want to compare that to legion lieutenant which is a two mana two two that gives your vampires plus one plus one now edgar does flip and can create up to three life linking one ones over three turns it takes a while but then let's compare that to like bitter blossom which creates one one flyers yeah and costs two mana and does that every turn i think there's a i just i understand combining those two cards is a little bit different but because you can't even do both at the same time on this card yeah you have to wait yeah, you got to do one and then the other. It's got to die. Here's um, the thing. Four mana. Let's say you play this without any ramp. You play it on turn four and you sack it that same turn because you have like an altar or a Phyrexian tower. And then you have to wait three more turns. So by turn seven, you get Edgar back and you made three one ones with your commander. Yeah, I think, I think what's awkward about it is that you want the anthem effect at a different point in the game than you want the token creation, right? Like, right. Like early game is when you want token creation because you're trying to set up to have a big board. And then once you have enough creatures, you want the anthem effect because early there's nothing to pump. Yeah. Later there is. But the problem with this is it starts on the anthem side and then turns to... So so in the earlier part of the game, it's the wrong side. The wrong and then side, it yeah. flips over later and becomes the token creation, which is now the wrong side for later in the game. And so there's just there's a natural tug and pull there that I think is opposite of what you want. Yeah, and you want to control the timing too because when you're trying to swing out for the win with a bunch of creatures, you need to do it on the turn that you want to. That's why Crater Hoof is so good. You play it and that same turn is the turn you win. With Edgar, it's like, well, I got to wait for these bloodline counters to count up. Hopefully no one does anything to stop my attacking <laughs> Vampire over. Empire. Yeah. Or you're so, like, well, I hope I can sacrifice an artifact. I guess you put KCI in there just so you could sack it and replay it. Oh, yeah. For the yeah. plus one, plus one though. But I that's think not worth it, yeah. I'd rather just play a Chroma's Will or something. Yeah, Edgar seems like very much a utility card in a vampire deck him leading the charge i think he's looking a little senile for that unfortunately he is looking a little bit old unfortunately um i will say there's a couple things obviously he makes tokens so you're going to want the standard token suite of white cards that we always talk about anointing procession cathars Cru crusade divine visitation yep it's a lot better obviously if you're getting a four four every turn i think you can maybe do some some tricky stuff with blink okay so, like, you've got it on the coffin side. You've made a couple tokens, hopefully put out some other vampires. Oh, but and it's, a, then, it's an artifact, so you got to make sure you can blink it. Yeah, artifact. you got to be able to blink an artifact because blink would get it back in, like, that same turn right. on its creature side, and then you can maybe use it as a combat trickle. I don't know. I'm reaching. It's, just it's, hard reaching. To find a, it's hard to find a way to, like, use this in a good way. We're definitely reaching here. Even Edgar, when in the OG Edgar deck, even if paired up with Anya, it doesn't, isn't that great because you only get that trigger once on Anya Made of Dishonor because right. it's on your upkeep for the vampire, so it's not like you're just making a ton of them. Now, I... This is, I think, balanced for not our format. Because uh, if this was our format, I think this would be totally fine if it was create one ones each upkeep and then it flips back to Edgar. That would be like good, but not good. even close to the original Edgar. Still Markov. wouldn't be as good as the original, which is fine. I don't think I don't want them creating commanders yeah. that are trying to be as good as the original Edgar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely like way down. I don't even think this is probably as good as Alenda. The oh, Dust, the Dust Rose. Rose. Yeah. You're likely to make a lot more vampire tokens in the Alenda deck than you ever will in the Edgar deck. Yeah. Edgar maybe goes in Alenda. Edgar goes into other decks. I think, you know, it maybe it's good in some Aristocrats builds because you can play it, sack it, get some tokens, but it just is really slow. And you won't know this until you play it and you're waiting for each upkeep and Edgar is just still sitting in this coffin and you're like, Edgar, when are you coming out, dude? Sun's down. <laughs> just chilling. He's just chill. I'm still in my coffin. Yeah, maybe you can proliferate the bloodline counters. I don't know. We're we're definitely stretching, so that should tell you that Edgar is fine. Not as a commander, more as a fun, flavorful piece. Probably in the ninety nine of other vampire decks. Sorry, Dracula.
Okay, the next one is Aerith Tormented Prophet. And I'll make a note that Aerith has been reskinned as a Dracula card and is Renfield. Ooh. Renfield, I think, is. Oh boy, my Dracula lore. Oh, my Dracula. I think is in the Insane Asylum. I think is one of the people in the Insane Asylum. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm right about that. Okay, uh, Aerith is one a blue and a red for a two four human ru- wizard legendary. Of course, if you would draw a card, exile the top two cards of your library instead. Hmm. You may play those cards this turn. So it turns all of your card draw into two cards, except it's impulsive draw. Yeah, you have to play them this turn. Yeah, and and we should say like this is sort of ostensibly double your card draw double your pleasure double your fun but but <laughs> impulsive draw is not as good as just straight up card draw there are definitely some downsides to impulsive draw one of the downsides like you said you have to play it until end of turn so you know things that you would like to hold till later or that are too expensive to cast right now or let's say you flip two lands you can only play one per turn yeah. you can't always take advantage of the fact that you've gotten multiple cards and one card is going away forever and if you don't play either of the cards they're both going away forever imagine untap Aerith. oh well i don't draw my card for turn i draw two and i show everyone you and show I them literally a- don't increase my hand size let's say there are two seven drops and it's turn four yep you didn't draw any cards that turn now and also, yeah, I like what you said there, which is you show them to the opponents. So the opponents get to see now everything you draw, basically, for the whole game. And and this works if you have a card that says, you know, draw extra cards. For each card draw, you would flip two cards. So it's cool if you're like, you know, play a card that says draw three cards. Mm-hmm. You would you would impulsively exile six cards to choose from. But they get to see all of that stuff. So it's going to be hard to head fake them, like play something first that they, you hope they counter removed and then yeah. play something else. They're going to know your options. I think this feels more like a combo piece in a specific deck that wants to go off and abuse the ability. But right now, this just reads to me as a very clunky, needs a ton of mana to work card. And blue likes operating at instant speed on other players' turns. I, I, I do think this is powerful. It does give you access to twice twice as many cards in yeah. the game as you would. So I think it's powerful. I'm just, I just want to make the statement that it's not the same as drawing two cards. It's definitely more like drawing one and a third card or something right, like right. that because of the downsides. But it does work, like we said, with things that magnify your draw. So if you have Teferi's Ageless Insight or Alhamarit's Archive, all of a sudden you're going to be revealing four cards every turn. And that starts to get pretty crazy. Yeah. Because now you're, you know, let's say you got Consecrated Sphinx out and something like that. You're, you're kind of tutoring at that point. You're looking at so many cards. Also, it's going to go through your deck really, really fast. So the Lab Maniac, Thassa's Oracle type wins might be a little bit easier because you are able to turn through your, you know, imagine yeah. that you stroke of genius yourself for 12. Well, that's 24 cards off your deck now or whatever. You do have to do it immediately. So I feel like Aerith, is, if you're going to play this deck, you kind of have to wait for your turn where you have either a ton of mana, you're able to high tide or you have a, just a bunch of, and you go, cool, play Aerith and then do this card draw effects. Now I look at 24 cards and this is how I get to my win condition. Um, it does feel really clunky if you're trying to play this on curve on turn two or three. It doesn't seem like that's exactly where you want to be with it. You want to hold off, wait for that ideal moment. Either you have a real out or whatever, you discard 20 cards, and then bam, you're looking at 40. I think if it's in the 99, but I think this deck, you could just play this on three, get the value out of, like, I'm looking at more cards than you, and just, you know, you maybe you're not even trying to do Thoughts Historical or whatever. You're just like, I'm just going to draw double cards for the whole game. Yeah, and but you be- don't actually draw them as the you, thing. You don't, but I mean, you're just looking at a lot, and you're going to have brainstorms and stuff yeah preordains all that stuff yeah. ponders i feel like this deck is stacked with them i feel like the cmc every cmc of this deck is like two to three any cantrip is really great because there's are usually one mana and one mana draw two cards is like super powerful yeah um and there is some combo stuff you can do too so you are not technically drawing cards anymore in a game anytime mm-hmm. you would go to draw a card you exile them instead this is a replacement effect right so you can Pull off some kind of mean stuff with this. And the biggest one, I think, is Possess Portal, which I'll read here. <laughs> it is six, or sorry, eight mana for an artifact. If a player would draw a card, uh, that player skips that draw instead. At uh, the end of each turn, each player sacrifices a permanent unless he or she discards a card Whoa. from his or her hand. So here's the thing. Y- if you have two replacement effects, you get to choose. Yeah the order of them. Aerith would say like, okay, I'm going to choose to, instead of drawing the card, exile the two cards from the top of my library. And then Possess Portal would say, oh, you don't get to draw cards. So I'm not. I'm exiling two cards off the top of my library. So you could still get to do your thing. Yeah. You still get to have your exile too and go, everyone else, however. All your opponents are like, oh, we're just not drawing cards for the rest of the game now. And they're actively discarding or sacrificing permanents at the end of each turn in Commander, four turns, every single turn cycle. Yep. That is going to shut down the game almost immediately. You'll win super fast because you're going to still play lands and cast things every turn. And they're going to run out of cards in hand really, really fast. And then the yeah. board will start getting eaten away. So it's a mean thing to do a little bit. But if they can't destroy Possessed Portal, they're also not going to 
draw any more answers to possess portal because they can't draw cards anymore <laughs> so it'll kind of be over pretty fast that's sad another one that's similar is zur's weirding which is three and a blue for an enchantment it says players play with their hands revealed if a player would draw a card he or she reveals it instead then any other player may pay two life if a player does put that card into its owner's graveyard otherwise that player draws the card oh. so you can stop people from drawing cards to life basically you stop anything but lands or things you don't care about mm -hmm. but you again do not have to abide by this rule because you impulsively exile the cards and then can play them until end of turn and nobody can pay two life because there's never a point at which you're about to draw a card okay so now this deck looks a little more realistic to me but it's kind of a mean version of it and i could see a being a sort of lockdown stasis blue red combo deck maybe even competitively and what i'll say is that blue's really really good at finding artifacts they got war of invention mm -hmm. fabricate things like that so you can find your possessed portal when you need to um, Uba Mask is another card that isn't as mean as the other ones, yep. but it's four mana for an artifact. If a player would draw a card, that player removes that card from the game face up instead, and then each player may play cards he or she removed from the game with Uba Mask this turn. So it does Aerith kind of, but for everybody, but yep. they don't get two, they only get one. One. And they can only, again, play that card until end of turn. So it kind of evens the playing field for you, makes everybody impulsive draw everything, but you're getting two for everybody's one. Um, so it also turns off things like smothering tithe and, w and whatever oh yeah that's right because the, the no draw is happening yeah, no draw is actually yeah. happening there's yeah. another one that's pretty mean <laughs> omen machine it's and six can be mana. dangerous yeah it's definitely dangerous it's six man artifact players can't draw cards and then at the beginning of each player's draw step that player exiles the top card of their library if it's a land card the player puts it onto the battlefield otherwise that player casts it without paying its mana cost if able so there you go it's kind of yeah it's, it's risky but it, it, it might fit into this whole thing i don't know that was just the way i took it as far as the most powerful stuff you could probably do with Aerith. yeah uh, besides the thassa's oracle lab man stuff which we already know is always powerful i like this last edition you said wild magic sorcerer so this is a three and a red four three that says the first spell you cast from exile each turn has cascade so that's a way to get a lot of value off your cards you can flip two cards maybe you have a three mana spell you cast it bam cascade cascade until you hit a two mana spell that's pretty powerful that way you can get uh, just a ton of advantage maybe you have a way to do something in blue and red you could even do like a straight damage route i think and just like keep lightning bolt shocking people and stuff would be interesting yeah even if you just hit a ponder right it's like yeah. okay well i'll impulsively draw two more cards just yeah. tacked on to my other card you know yeah and if you play a one mana spell with cascade that means you could be dropping out a lot of those zero mana cards that have suspender whatever, definitely right? gonna hit your mana crypt or whatever Right. Yeah, or the the any of the like the there's that soul oh yeah, yeah. Ox tantalite type stuff. Yep. Where you so I think this deck could be powerful and will have a lot of value, but I just don't want people to get confused. You got to um, build it. You got a very specific way, I think, to to fully maximize. Otherwise, there will be a lot of downside to that impulsive yeah. draw. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next one is a fan favorite. It's Gronok the Omnivore. Couldn't go back to this plane without making a couple of frogs. Uh, it's two, a blue, and a green for a legendary creature frog. Three, three. Whenever a frog you control attacks, mill three cards. Whenever a permanent card is put into your graveyard from the library, your library, exile it with a croak counter on it. You may play lands and cast spells from among cards you own in exile with croak counters on it. Okay, so I the first... Want, I just want to note real quick yeah. that these huge frogs always have a human arm sticking out of their mouth. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they've been eaten. What else are they going to eat? They have but they never want to eat the arm. They always just want to... Yeah, like... it's like it's like a toothpick. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just frog toothpicks, actually. Yeah, they're frog toothpicks. <laughs> kind of gross and disgusting, but very stylish, too. So this is cool. This cares about frogs attacking to mill cards, and then anytime a permanent card is put into uh, your graveyard from your library, you exile. So not not instant sorceries. Yeah. yeah. So croak counter stuff goes on lands, creatures, enchantments, artifacts, planeswalkers, all that a, good stuff. A lot of stuff. Well, okay, so frogs... When frogs you control attack, it does the thing. It mills. Um, there are only 21 frogs in the history of magic that are in either green or blue. Ooh. So there's not very many. I think not you could many. add changelings to the mix. For sure. Yeah. Kaldheim had a bunch of cards yep. that are green and blue with changeling abilities. Masked Vandal. Be great. Realm Walker. Really good. Um, so there are ways. And they both count as frogs. They both count as frogs because they're changelings. Um, and you can even cast more frogs off the top of your library. But there aren't that many frogs. And also the frogs in history of magic are not really edh playable for the most part yeah the, yeah i said they're 21 but there might be two that are good like yeah they're, they're all pretty bad um so i think you probably i mean listen if frog tribal sounds fun to you that's a thing you can do um you know, there's not a lot to say about that i i would say though the, the more powerful version of this deck is almost certainly just ignore the frog stuff and just go heavy self mill because grolnock doesn't care it says whenever a permanent card is put into your graveyard from your library exile it with a croak counter on it mm -hmm. so it doesn't care if the frog attacking caused you to mill those cards you can mill from anywhere 
uh, and it'll still get the croak counters. And then it says you may play lands and cast spells from among the cards you own in exile with croak counters on them. So as long as Grohl necks out and you've self-milled the stuff... Uh, the thing to note here is because it's just looking for croak counters. Yeah. It also doesn't care if Gronok died and came back. Right. It'll still say, oh, well, that's still got a croak counter. It's not It's not like some other cards that just exile them and then don't you see them when they again, come yeah. back. Paco yeah. and Haldan's a little similar with fetch counters as well. Yeah. This is the way they've sort of found a, a around it. And I think for Commander specifically, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so, so that part sounds like it can be pretty powerful so self mill cards like life from the loam which has dredge uh hedron crab which is landfall mill and because you can play the lands that you've croaked away um very good that's good persistent petitioners a lot of people saying this could be a good persistent petitioners deck that's the oh yeah that's the one where you can have as many as you want in the deck kind of like shadowborn apostles but they tap to mill and you can tap four of uh, four advisors to control to mill 12 cards from your library into the graveyard or anyone Uh, i think hermit druid's probably the best card in the deck and the combo e Fantastic, your favorite Jimmy card. Because yep. you could build a Girl Knock deck that just has zero basic lands in it, right? Yep. So you tap Hermit Druid is always going to mill you out. And because the fact that Girl Knock will let you play all the permanent cards, as long as Thassa's Oracle is somewhere in your deck when you do that, it'll get exiled with a Croak Counter on it and you can just cast it and win yep. after Hermit Druid gets activated. And you can have that play pattern every single time. You can basically guarantee it. The only thing it will get in your way is if you accidentally draw Thassa's Oracle yeah. <laughs> and it's in your hand. But then you just you don't... Just play it out of your hand after you activate the Hermit Druid. Yeah, exactly. So that's also not a big problem. I guess actually, yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah. Gronk definitely seems... There's a lot of talk on CDH uh, subreddits and threads about this because it, there's just a lot of ways to get to it. So cards like Intuition, it's two in the blue for an instant you search library for three cards and reveal them then the opponent chooses one that card goes to your hand and the rest go into your graveyard uh, because those cards are from your library to your graveyard they don't enter into another exile they zone. never go to your hand or anything yeah they're yeah. from the graveyard to the so gronok will see them so you're essentially drawing three cards with intuition now uh, and then you can just find lion's eye diamond concordant crossroads and your thassa's oracle or your hermit druid and then blam you're just off to the races you can instantly combo off and win factor fiction as well you reveal the top five cards of your library and then one of those cards goes into your graveyard one of those piles goes into your graveyard so blam you get all five of those cards in your hand or the graveyard because of girl knock uh, or they get exiled and then you can just you know if your deck has stuff like lotus petal mana crypt other zero mana chrome moxes you're able to play those from exile with girl knock you're able to get the man you need and then just instantly combo off off. Yeah, you, you can, could activate Hermit Druid without enough to cast yeah. Thassa's Oracle and get the things to cast it just out of the, the Moxon and things that get thrown into your uh, into Exile with Croak counters on it. Yeah. So it seems very, very powerful from a combo-tastic perspective. Yeah, you power out Gronok really quickly, or you get Hermit Druid, then Gronok, and then blam. You have your entire deck to play, and guaranteed in all those cards, you're going to find a way to get enough mana to either make some sort of infinite combo or whatever to just win the game on the spot. Now, you don't have to build the combo-tastic version. You can, of course, just kind of go for value, mm-hmm. self-mill, and self-mill becomes, you know, virtually card draw. I think it will still be very powerful. It may, might feel a little bit like Moldrotha or something, Yeah, where, you know, you are just getting car- like getting a ton of card advantage and see you know kind of tutoring a lot too because you can self mill so many things at a time and you're just like well which of these 30 cards do i want to choose from with uh croak counters on it because yeah. you, you'll basically play the entire deck maybe only have less than 10 cards that aren't a permanent yeah and, and then there's of course the same the food chain eternal scourge right. combos to get infinite mana and a lot of cdh players are also saying like you can play city of solitude it's a two and a green enchantment each player may play spells and abilities only during their turn or defense grid which basically locks down everyone else from interacting with your combo and then you go off so the deck has a lot of different ways you know to basically just like beat past the the other table trying to the rest of the table trying to stop you and a lot of them are permanents that can get exiled with croak counters yada yada you get the idea yep basically if you see girl knock you gotta kill it yeah you gotta groan you gotta rib it and you gotta murder it <laughs> and hope you don't end up in its mouth <laughs> yeah because all you're gonna have left is your arm at that point <laughs> that's a bummer at least you'll have your arm yeah yeah <laughs> he doesn't eat the whole thing does your arm know that the rest of your body's gone or is it who knows i don't know how that works at all <laughs> all right we've got uh looks like one two three four five six seven more c- multicolored commanders from crimson vow to talk about but before we continue we're going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors Seriously, Mr. Oaktree, it's the best. You gotta- Oh, hello, Magic Player. It's me, Jiraga Tree Speaker, and I was just telling my pal Oaktree here about Peloton. For me, leveling up is intuitive. It's right there in my reminder text. But for you humans, and trees, fitness can be intimidating. Maybe you don't know where to start, or you don't want to screw up in front of your friends and woodland critters. I get it. 
But with Peloton, fitness is easy. Peloton offers classes for everyone, whether you're a budding novice or a fully bloomed pro, all from the comfort of home. I thought I was maxed out already, but I found a bunch of fun classes that took my game to the next level. And it's not just about cycling. Peloton's top tier instructors can guide you through everything, from strength yoga to Pilates to meditation. Plus, you can fit in workouts on your own time, even if you only have 15 minutes. That's much better than my old sorcery speed leveling, and perfect for when chatterboxes like old Oakstra here like to talk my ear off all day. Right, buddy? Hey man, I was just teasing. No need to get personal. Experience motivation like never before with the Peloton bike. Now $400 less. Go to OnePeloton.com to learn more. That's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. Hail Thorosians! I, Gary Merchant of Asphodel, bring word of trade! The coffee subscription service, fit for the gods! Halt! Coffee is not allowed here on Eryxmethes, the slumbering isle. The aroma could awaken our sleeping home. Trade is worth the risk. They aim to make every cup of coffee your best ever. I was sent this Colombian whole bean roast from Anodyne Roasting Co. I loved it so much, I had to spread the word. But our people know nothing of coffee. Just take Trade's coffee quiz, and they will guide you to the perfect match from over 400 craft coffees. Trade guarantees you will love your first bag, or they will replace it free of charge. And you can give trade feedback as you sip, so as your preferences evolve, so too will your coffee matches. I can resist no longer. Let the brewing begin! Ah. Uh. The island wakes! We're doomed! Totally worth it. For our listeners right now, Trade is offering your first bag free and $5 off your bundle at checkout. To get yours, go to drinktrade.com slash command and use promo code command. Take the quiz to start your journey to the perfect cup. That's drinktrade.com slash command, promo code command for your first bag free and $5 off your bundle. Enjoy! Bruins and Silas, Vice Cops. This episode, Stage Fright. This is it, Bruce, our very own press conference. We'll get the keys to the city, keys to the undercity. Ugh, there's so many people out there. You'll be fine, partner. Just remember to smile. And show them my teeth? Ah, oh, geez, they are not camera ready. I'm actually pretty sensitive about them. I'm sure better brushing habits would help with your confidence. You should try Quip. They deliver all the oral care essentials straight to your door, so it's easy to develop a healthy routine. The Quip electric toothbrush has timed sonic vibrations with 30 second pulses to guide you toward a dentist recommended two minute clean. And beyond the brush, Quip provides toothpaste, mouthwash, floss, and more. Shipping is free, and electric brushes start at just $25. So you can build a complete oral care regimen and take better care of your teeth today. Okay, we're on. You memorize your speech, right? Speech? If you go to getquip.com slash command zone right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash command zone. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash command zone. Quip, the good habits company. All right, we are back talking about the multicolored commander from Crimson Vow. The next is uh, one that <laughs> we made a fun mistake about originally, but it's great. Uh, Halana and Elena have returned, comma, partners. Not partners, sisters. so we can't screw it up. They're not can't sisters. They're yeah. lovers. They're partners. And not even partner. Commander is just straight up partners. All it's right. two, Yeah, it's two characters on one card, so yeah. <laughs> they don't have partner. Partner, yeah. <laughs> I really love the alt art for this, too. The, the showcase? Yeah, yeah, it's really, really cool. sweet. All right, so this is two a red and a green for a 2-3 legendary creature, Human Ranger, with first strike and reach. At the beginning of combat on your turn, put X plus one plus one counters on another target creature you control, where X is Halana and Elena's power. That creature gains haste until end of turn. So every single combat, this is going to give minimum two plus one plus one counters on other creatures, and then they're going to gain haste. Feels a little like Xanagos yeah. uh, in how this is probably going to play out. I will say that plus one plus one counters as a theme, not as robust in gruel colors as in like Celestia or something like that. Yeah. Uh, there's just been less red cards that kind of care about plus one plus one counters. There are some. It's not like there are none, but it's But not. it is, yeah. Xenagos gives a temporary buff and this gives a plus one plus one counter, which is a permanent buff. And That's so true. the creatures will get pretty beefy. Reminds me of... If they stick around for long enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think this deck will probably have focus issues and be tough to balance because, you know building having built decks like this in the past it's hard to sort of balance what you need to put your resources into because you need to buff halana and elena voltron them a little mm -hmm. bit but yeah. you also need to have other creatures on the board that they can buff and voltron decks just don't often want to have a bunch of other creatures on the board because other creatures aren't buffing the voltron piece right so 
that balance I can, I've found difficult in the past. And, and I would just, you know, say to people to just beware of that. And that's going to take a lot of tinkering to get the right mixture, I think. Yeah. And red green isn't the artifact equipment colors either. So you may be thinking, okay, maybe it's an enchantment or that I do it with. Okay. Or maybe it's just a sword of Feast and Famine. That yeah. It's hard to find them. key pieces for that, right? Whereas white yeah. and blue can easily, f you know, go find the equipment. White's really good at it, obviously. Yeah. So it, this reminds me a lot of Azurian Claw Progress because it's adding plus one, plus one counters. Mm. Uh, but X is equal to the number of experience counters. But you can, you know, you see how fast those creatures grow out of control and get big this time we're doing it in the monster red green colors instead of green blue sure sure i like i said my my worry is always like if i have a bunch of cards that pump helena and elena yeah it's also hard to have my enough creatures on the board for them to affect i think one of the ways around this is creature lands oh cute so this might be a good answer is kind of like muta vault mishra's factory uh, right. They, yeah, I think you want ones that cost very little to activate because you don't want to be paying a ton of mana to turn your stuff into creatures and then you can't do other things in the turn. Yeah. But Mutavault gives you, is actually a, a great way to do this because you activate Mutavault, go to combat, give it two counters, it swings for four, and that's just on a base, right? On a lot of them have them buffed or whatever. And then at the end of turn, it actually goes back to being a land, much harder to for them to do anything with, but it'll keep the counters. Yeah. And then yeah, you yeah, can yeah. do that sort of again and again. Mistress Factory would work the same way. I think Ink Moth and Blink Moth Nexus are also good candidates for this to yep. just make sure that you have creatures available to you so that your main plan can be in line. Yeah, I like that you can't affect them as well. And green has a lot of ways to turn lands into creatures as well. So that could be definitely the way you do it is Halana Laner just buffing up a whole army of lands and stuff. Dead. A lot of those turn those lands and the creatures for good, though, and then, then they can be affected by destroy target creatures, yeah, spells, yeah, totally. and things like that. Uh, when I saw Ink Moth, uh, you know, maybe Craig has uh, gotten inside my brain a little too much. It made me think, <laughs> like, actually, I, Infect is probably the most powerful version of what this deck could be. Yeah, I think so. So this seems like, you know, Glistener Elf, Viridian Corruptor, Phyrexian Hydra seems really, really good because it can almost just merc somebody right away. And because they give haste. Yeah. So you go, boom, play the thing, give it haste, put some counters on it. So now it's like the thing only has to hit him for 10 all of a sudden. Yeah, and if Frank Hydra is a five mana seven, seven, by the way. So that almost immediately with Helena and Elena could get up to 10. And if you've given them any buff, it definitely will just mark somebody out of nowhere. Equipment are good in Infect deck as well. Yeah. You need to give them trample or ways for them to get above flying with all that stuff. So I could definitely see that actually working well here. And that's what I like about it, because if they kill Helena and Elena, you, you could still sort of have a chance to get in there and knock people out with yeah. just the other cards in your deck if they've got infect i know a lot of people think infect is mean i've found it to be not very powerful it's really good at knocking out like one person and then everyone goes oh time to murder that player or they get ready <laughs> they go oh you're gonna try and kill me through combat i'm just gonna play all my cards that stop that from happening and i will never like tap all the way out i'll leave my yeah. I'll always leave my removal up and things like that have you heard of maze of it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Infect is not an easy way to win the game, but this does seem like a fun way to do so. I mean, and you also have proliferate triggers that could just Yeah, break. Evolution Sage is in green, and yeah, you could yeah. definitely, like, you don't have to kill them in one hit. You just kind of get them close, and then you can get the rest of the way with some other cards. Yeah, actually, proliferate works great with the counters and the Infect, because yeah. those are both counters you can climb up. Oh, right, with, with the plus one, plus one counters, yeah, too. Yeah, 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 for sure. It also takes advantage of, um, you know, Red's pump spells, like Unleash Fury, which will double a creature's power. Yeah. You know, Rush of Blood, Lunar Frenzy. Red's really good at that part, but that stuff is usually not very good if it's just like, hey, hit you for eight more than I was going to. <laughs> yeah. But if it's hit you and kill you with Infect now, then it's worth a card. If it's like this card now mm -hmm. KOs other players rather than just like deals a fi you know twenty percent of their life total, then I don't think that's worth a card. Um, then, the, yeah. you know, I want to say it also opens up Chandra's Ignition, which is kind of like the best Infect win con. Right, because it deals damage to everyone for that creature's power, and it's three red red. Yeah. So if you can just get a creature with Infect to 10 power, and yeah. then a Chandra's Ignition, you win. I mean, this might be a world, too, where you could play an Infect and just a Combat Matters deck, and you have green, so you can tutor up creatures really easily, and based on what's happening, you can go, okay, you know what, I'd rather beat face, or, hey, I need to just Infect someone out because they are at 1,000 life now. Yeah. Yeah, it can definitely knock people out of nowhere no matter what else has happened in the game, which I, I tend to like about these decks because of the haste. Yeah. I wanted to say that as describing this, this feels like Infectagos, which we've played against for sure, and is a you know is powerful but not crazy. Mm -hmm. And and that got me thinking, is this better than a Xenagos Infect deck? It feels like it kind of isn't. Xenagos has this nice thing where you can't interact with him. <laughs> yeah, because it's not a creature, so he's very hard to kill. I will say, though, the Xenagos doesn't actually work really well with a lot of infect creatures. Like Glistener Elf, not great. Adds one power to right, it. Right. Helena Elena is actually better for Glistener Elf than Xenagos is. And a lot of um, 
good infect creatures that don't cost a lot of mana are not very high power. Mm -hmm. So it could be actually that this is a little bit better for the infect strategy because adding two power to something that only has one power is actually better than doubling its power yeah 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 i I could see this being again if you have equipment already or if you have ways to pump your creatures in the infect deck you could definitely have a lunar frenzy on halana elena and then blam you're you're attacking with them they have trample they're an 11 12 or whatever and then you can use those same counters and you put 11 counters on something else so i think combat tricks actually work well much better than xenagos because xenagos again it's plus x plus o so it doesn't stick around yeah so plus one plus counters make a big difference so i think this could be an okay deck but it's gonna be combat based it's probably gonna be one of those decks that like knocks out one player every game and then just can't ever get the third player yeah, red green again suffering from kind of similar problems to white blue in terms of it has a very specific direction, but that direction isn't necessarily the most fun, at least not to me. Uh, it's just um, similar all the time. It's it's big yeah. beat face kind of stuff. It, there's not as many options or landfall. <laughs> yeah, actually that's true. There are landfall lands matter decks. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one, which is a new version of Audric blood cursed audric's got red now he's one red and a white because and he looks mad he's angry for yeah sure. <laughs> which red that makes sense <laughs> one red white for a three three legendary creature vampire soldier hey audric wasn't a vampire before right no nope. he was a human he's definitely a human so he's been embraced okay i don't know anything about the story except there's a wedding right there's it's a, olivia and edgar it looks like he's busting into the wedding he or is a part of the wedding. he is a wedding crasher yeah that is for sure all right sorry three mana three three when audric enters the battlefield create x blood tokens where x is the number of you guessed it abilities uh from uh from among flying first strike double strike death touch haste hexproof indestructible lifelink Minache, reach trample and vigilance found among creatures you control so you look at all your creatures you go how many different uh, uh, of these abilities do we have let's say it's one two three four you get four blood tokens okay this is on etb of audric and there is white so ephemerate cloud shift all those cards will work with bringing him back in so you might be able to get a bunch of tokens yeah it feels um, like it's not gonna be that hard to like play Adric, get four blood tokens you know where's skulk where's it was, it was on an original. i think they are uh i think the philosophy at wizards is let's never speak of skulk again like oh, the, man. yeah i think that's a failed experiment that they're <laughs> just gonna was, pretend it was never on happened. an old audrey but no longer where's skulk? Um, said no one ever <laughs> said no one ever <laughs> but this is nice you can flicker and blink audrey obviously you're gonna want to if you want to create more blood tokens because the blood tokens aren't gonna do too much for you so maybe you can find something to do with them instead yeah i, I think that's one of the big problems with audrey is red black is the blood token archetype Mm -hmm. uh in crimson vow and black actually has like most of the payoff cards right the cards that say well here's what you can do with blood tokens once you have them and this doesn't have black so you're missing like a whole like white doesn't really do blood tokens at all in the set yeah so the question becomes with audric like what do you do with the blood tokens because in general as we said earlier right they're not that great if you don't have a lot of synergies going on and i think there's a deck that i think we've talked about a lot over the years and i'm just going to name it the artifact volume theme deck and that that, by volume i mean the amount of artifacts you have is what matters yeah so it's the togo deck it's these decks that play inspiring statuary gear per ether grid kci crook clan ironworks yeah and they're just saying like like togo the rocks themselves you might throw one or two but like you're just trying to create a lot of them and then use them in a way that just says hey when i got 40 artifacts I'm cooking. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what those artifacts are. They can be food. They can be treasures, rocks. Whatever. They can be treasures. But I'm going to use them in an unintended way. Right. You know, I'm going to tap them for mana directly. Or I'm going to sacrifice them for two mana. Or you you put in things that like say when an artifact enters a battlefield, blah, blah, blah. Reckless Fireweaver deals one damage to each opponent. So that is a way to, again, you have Audric out. You have a Smothering Tithe. You flicker Audric. You have a Reckless Fireweaver out. You're doing six damage every single turn to everyone. That's a quick way to end the game. Um, and it definitely is not typically what red white is trying to do um there's also cards that you know like togo i think is a great example it's just like you just want to get a lot of things out there and then when those things are out there they're going to do damage to people in unintentional or interesting ways yeah you're going to tap them for gear per ether grid and and use them as direct damage yeah and then throw some rocks and then you are going to have to have some keywords on creatures though otherwise audric is going to enter the battlefield and make no blood tokens yeah and that won't go so of course you're still going to have like zatalpa um a chroma, a chroma's memorial, maybe things like that that just mean like, okay, now I've when I play Audric, I'll get you know four or so yeah. blood tokens. Maybe I'll flicker them a couple times, get up to eight, twelve blood tokens, and now the rest of my plan starts rolling. The inspiring statuary and things like that. The real sucky part about Audric is that you can play them on as early as turn 
two or three, but you anything. need to ha- he doesn't have any of those keywords. So you need to do this weird balance where it's like, I need to make a lot of creatures with keywords on top of having creatures like Reckless Fireweaver. So you're instantly split in two different directions if you're trying to go for the artifact volume theme. Yeah, the, he really needs to have first strike or something. Yeah, so at least it's a, a three man. Like, you know, blood token. Like, give me one at least. Yeah, he should have skulk. <laughs> he should have skulk. But it doesn't. And list it doesn't. It. <laughs> <laughs> that That's would have the been real wizard. Like, yeah. Can you imagine like, the amount of complaining if they did that. Yeah, and someone at Wizards might get fired for that too. <laughs> it's like, why did you do this? So yeah. I, I think this is another deck that's just going to be really hard to have it come together and actually work because it's going to be s- very unfocused. If you go towards like, I need keywords. Well, the blood tokens don't play into that plan at all. At all, yeah. So what are you doing with them, and why does that even help you? But if you don't have keywords, then you won't get the blood tokens. But then you, like, okay, I need keywords to happen. I need to play Audric. I make a bunch of artifacts, and then I use those artifacts, so I need to draw the other cards that care about having all the other. It's it's very hard for this deck to, like, do its thing every game. It's going to feel like a lot of times you only draw one-third of it that doesn't. And then how does this deck win, exactly? If it's just, like, attack with Zatalpa, then why do you need all the artifact stuff going on? Yeah, also Zatalpa is a nine-mana spell, so try getting that and Audric out at the same time it's gonna be tough yeah i think blood tokens just would have had to be better on their own as a thing for yeah. this deck to really come together and this just feels like uh it's just gonna be super unfocused you might do a lot of things but i don't know that that's gonna add up to like any sort of victories in games yeah it's fine because between anya edgar and Audric, they're all the three different color pairings for mardu and the vampire deck but none of them are great sort of on their own in their similar color pairings. So you want to have a three color deck with these things to like give you the full use of all of that. Yeah. And it just I think keeps, Anya is pretty good, but yeah, the other two yeah, are good. It just keeps playing back to the original Edgar Markov because he's just the Mardu vampire commander and unfortunately very hard to get. And probably a little too strong that card. Probably, oh my gosh. I've <laughs> never won against that card. <laughs> it's very good. All right, next up we got Old Rutstein. He's looking old and ruddy. He's won a black and a green for a one for a human peasant. When old Rutstein enters the battlefield or at the beginning of your upkeep, mill a card. If a land card is milled this way, create a treasure token. If a creature card is milled this way, create a 1-1 green insect creature token. If a non-creature, non-land card is milled this way, create a blood token. All right, so this enters the battlefield, mills your card, every upkeep mills your card, and depending on what's milled, you get one of three different things. So you a get treasure, a 1-1, one, one, or a blood. Yep, and it makes sense, right? Lands equal treasures, creatures equal 1-1s, one, and then not everything else is blood. The thing is, this creating of something, of one kind of token, is tied to only old rutstein's ability right so you can't mill in other ways and get things which makes it really hard to to quote unquote break this card it's going to be just super fair right because you really can't trigger that it's it's difficult to trigger this multiple times per turn you're going to get your upkeep trigger or your etb trigger but there's no blink in golgari really Mm -hmm. i guess you could sack it and reanimate it but like that's a lot of hoops to jump through yeah, it's just hard to figure out a way where it's like, I do this, and I don't know what I'm going to get, but I'm going to get six things, you know? Yeah, I think Old Rutstein is pretty meh overall. It's You could do some token synergy stuff. You can be like, oh, cool, now I'm going to, every time I land, it gets milled with him. I get a parallel lives that make two, two treasures. Yeah, two treasures is okay. Yeah, I mean, it's okay, but it, you have to wait for your upkeep for it to happen. You also don't know what you're going to mill, and in black and green, there's so many ways to mill stuff that Old Rutstein feels actually kind of inefficient, because what if you just get a blood token? And we, as we've discussed, blood tokens aren't that amazing. I'd much rather have a treasure token. I don't even even want just it. one treasure for a three mana one four, like that is not commander level power. And right? you're in green so it's not like you're gonna have trouble accessing more mana like let's say this card said when it enters the battlefield create a treasure token and then every upkeep create a treasure token oh okay that's a little better but it's still not amazing right? yeah it's not amazing smothering and, tide lasts and i think that's kind space. of the best you're hoping for i guess you might want one ones but like you definitely don't want blood all that time no you definitely don't so blood is like when you lose the role yeah <laughs> like, yeah that's, that's <laughs> the bad side of rng yeah i think you play this in some black and green decks maybe so you get extra of the thing so gris the hunger tiger already wants to make insect creature tokens so maybe there's a way for that to feel good get rock monster says hey mill a land card draw a card so now you get a treasure and you draw with old rutstein hey look at the art on uh get rock monster there i just hey, want you to notice what's hanging arm. out of get rocks mouth maybe it's old rutstein's arm uh, and then, like, maybe Sadisi Brood Tyrant, so that when you mill something or a creature, you're going to get a 2-2 two, two, and a 1-1, one, one. but even then... No, no, you won't. Oh, I got yeah, only yeah, yeah. if you do it off Old Rutsi's trigger, scene, but yeah. not Sadisi's trigger. Yeah, not Sadisi's yeah. trigger. So, it's like, that. that is definitely the thing that hampers us the most, that it's tied specifically to Old Rutsi's team, whereas all the cards I just talked about, Gitrog and Sadisi... They're they, like, mill from anywhere. Mill from anywhere. Thing. Yeah, do the thing. So, Old Rutsi's is 
not overwhelmingly great. We just I just s- think it's bad, we're honestly. Just yeah, I don't think we're even going to see it in like Gristex or anything. I just don't think it's good enough. Yeah. All right, the next one is The Bride. Here she comes, Olivia Crimson <laughs> Bride. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> She's also on this cool deck box from Ultra Pro. Very cool. All right, four black red. So six mana for a three, four Vampire Noble. Has flying and haste. Though. Okay. Haste, haste is important. very important here. <laughs> Whenever Olivia attacks, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, tapped and attacking. It gains, when you don't control a legendary vampire, exile this creature. So it stays on the battlefield. You expected that to say it gains sacrifices at the end of combat or something. This says, hey, if they get rid of Olivia, probably get rid of the exile the thing too, but... You could also have an Anya out. It's a legendary you, vampire. You could get a legendary vampire back with this, and then that oh. will be a legendary vampire that you control, so it would never... It just never goes away until you get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's one way to go. But, I mean, obviously, we want to get huge Blightsteel Colossuses and things, because this is insane. It's like Alesha, except for no restriction. Right. Like, you don't pay no mana, and it doesn't have to be a certain size. You just go, boom, What what's the coolest thing you got in your graveyard? Let's put that out. Tap it has to be an Eldrazi without the shuffle clause on it, and there are plenty. Oh, because uh, otherwise it can't sit in your graveyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, for sure, I think this does not need to be a vampire tribal. The, you can definitely build it that way, and there's a lot of legendary vampires and stuff which would be really interesting to do but you i think you just want to get the biggest craziest things out there yeah that so, seems like so the, the first step of the plan is obviously like get creatures into your graveyard um so you know you can self mill with like stitcher supplier millikin stuff like that millikin's great in this deck yeah um you can also discard or rummage stuff away with yep. blood tokens or cards like chainer and nightmare adept uh kind of runs along the same lines here faithless um, looting if a if a deck even can sort of consider playing faithless looting it's so efficient that i love that card it's yeah, so powerful yeah, yeah. thrill of possibility blue red has a lot of that kind of stuff which mm-hmm. is like you replace the cards and you, it's like basically oh i want these two cards in my hand to go in my graveyard and draw two cards a lot of times you're like i'll hit my land drop and put something big in my graveyard this is win-win yeah because you weren't going to cast it regularly anyway and then maybe other ways to like sneak or t- Cheat stuff out, so sneak attack. Ah, that's a really good one. Sneak attack is great with both ends of the strategy, right? Like, yeah, get sneak attack out. I sneak attack a huge thing, smack somebody with it, goes to my graveyard. Next turn, I play Olivia, get the thing back out again. Yeah, you know, and now I get to maybe keep it for good. Yeah, that's pretty dang good. Perforos Bronze Blood Mm -hmm. is the new Perforos that does it for artifacts or creature red creature cards, and probably gonna have a lot of red creature cards in your deck, especially those big dragons and stuff. Yeah, really similar to sneak attack. Um, Uh, One thing I think to be worried about is because the clause says when you don't control a legendary vampire exile this creature that's uh, okay. a little scary uh, because when it goes to exile when you replay olivia it won't be an option for you to get out of the graveyard anymore mm-hmm. so i think you're going to want sack outlets so that in response to killing olivia or board wipes or whatever you can um sack your board say Save oh before yeah. yeah before olivia dies i'm going to sack this stuff so it does go to my graveyard so but you're, you're in red and black they are the best sacrifice colors so it's not gonna be hard you have the altars yeah you even have the the ones that sack a creature to draw you cards as well you have your henny undying partisan oh that's a great one because it's free <laughs> goblin bombardment is a really good one and then i think olivia triggers on combat yep so extra combats are going to be very powerful with her because you attack bring out your blight steel play an extra combat spell no blight steel no blight steel oh because it would re- yeah shuffle, you're right yeah. it would shuffle um, you, you attack imagine if you could bring out the blight steel but you can't so you choose something else but each time you think about blight steel <laughs> sure <laughs> some big aldrazi that didn't uh didn't make Path you shuffle. Or Mog, yeah. sure and then um then untap. you play another extra combat spell untap do it again bring out another big thing some yeah. big dragon or whatever uh that seems very powerful and then there's a particular card that is seems broken with olivia and it's port razor yeah, three red red for a four four. Whenever Port Razor deals combat damage to a player, untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there is an additional combat phase. And Port Razor can't attack a player it has already attacked this turn. Thank goodness you have three to choose from. And also, you probably have sack effects. Yeah. So what you can probably do is attack with Olivia, oh! hit him with Port Razor. Sack it. Sack it. Attack with Olivia again, brings Port Razor back out. Oh and my goodness. One thing we should mention is because the creature comes in tapped and attacking, anything that says when it attacks, do this, will not trigger because right. it comes in already attacking and will not trigger on attack effects. But Port Razor is on combat damage. Yep. So that means you can just stack up unlimited extra combats definitely if you have one person you can attack you're probably gonna be able to win that game yeah and olivia's a three four flying hey so the port razor is just the only thing that has to deal damage so you have to find a way for that to get through but it shouldn't be too hard you've you're red black you got removal you got all sorts of things goblin bombardment could even kill kill creatures by sacking things so there's lots of ways to get in i think yeah so 
it seems very powerful, very fun. Uh, a lot of cool stuff you're going to be able to do. She's six mana, so you're not going to be able to do it so early that it feels like it's going to be super broken. Yeah, and you don't have great ramp in red and black, but you do have a lot of options now. Milliken, again, is great in this deck. Um, I, I actually would be interested to see how this plays in like a Kalia of the Vast deck because mm -hmm. oftentimes you play Kalia, you get like one crazy thing out, everyone wipes the board, they get rid of everything. And then Olivia is a way to get that back and get the creature back uh, without having to replay Kalia, cheat out another thing. Because you're already playing like reanimate yeah, type spells yeah. in there. So you might have a huge 6-6 six, six whatever. A Runes Guard Demon or something. Yeah. yeah. And Olivia having haste is so huge in that, right? Because they will never see it coming. You untap and it looks like your whole board's dead and yeah. you go... Boom, Olivia, attack, get the thing, get Avacyn back out. You Avacyn, know. Karmic Guy, yeah. have the combo go off again. So it's, yeah. I, I like Olivia a lot. I think it's right in the uh, sort of a good spot. Very powerful, but mm -hmm. doesn't seem like crazy. I think Rakdos, Lord of Riots, too, is a great deck mm -hmm. to put Olivia in because you're already going to be throwing massive Huge things, things in yeah. that, that deck, yeah. Yeah, Terror of Mount Velis, Balefire Dragon, those were two we kind of earmarked as cool big things that don't have on attack triggers yeah they're in the battlefield terror gives everything double uh double strike and then balefire deals damage to each creature that player controls when it deals combat damage so that's just a board wipe on the one side of the board wipe yep yeah so good, cool. good times i like olivia yeah okay next up we got runo stormkirk and krothis lord yeah, of the deep too. so the cool one yeah he does look pretty cool Ru runo storm stromkirk is one a blue and a black frame. oh wait i want to say something oh yeah uh olivia had a Dracula reskin, and it is the Sisters of the Undead. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we don't have that card, but we know it exists. There's and we some, have the artwork uh, digitally. There's some Dracula mega fan out there that is very stoked about all. You're this. welcome, Dracula mega fan. <laughs> You're welcome. Didn't want, didn't want to skip it. Okay. So Runo Stromkirk is one a blue and a black. It's a one four with six abs, and it's a legendary <laughs> creature, vampire cleric. That's called a six pack. This one is definitely. Oh my yeah, lord, he, he's buff. That's an eight pack on yours. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, back to the text here. With flying, we got when, <laughs> when Runo Stormkirk enters the battlefield, put up to one target creature card from your graveyard on top of your library. At the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card. If a creature card with mana value 6 or greater is revealed this way, transform Runo Stormkirk into Krothis, Lord of the Deep. <laughs> Legendary creature, Kraken Horror. Three, Release five. the Krothis! Release the Krothis! Has flying, again, even Three, though it's in the flyer. ocean. Okay. Whenever Krothis, Lord of the Deep, attacks, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of another target attacking creature. If that creature is a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent, create two of those tokens instead. That's it. They stick around. That's it. They don't go away at the end of turn. They don't go away. So if you attack with Krothis and something else, you can make a copy of that something else. And if it is a sea creature, you get to make two copies of the something else. Yep, and they don't go away. They stick around. So this is actually pretty darn powerful, I think. I mean, making tokens like this we know is powerful from Volo and, and things mm -hmm. like that. I just can't get over the fact that it has flying because that doesn't make any sense based on what I'm looking at. Maybe it's like mid about to be flying. You know, it's coming out of the ocean. From what? There's no wings or anything. <laughs> magical. Okay. Yeah, it's maybe magical it's got flying. floating. Um, so this obviously screams sea tribal, sea creature tribal. We've seen a lot of cards over the past, oh geez, 10 years that point towards specifically Krakens, Leviathans, Octopus, or Serpents. Um, Quest for Ula's Temple is a blue enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may look at the top card of the library. If it's a creature card, you may reveal it and put a quest counter on Quest for Ula's Temple, which is great because you're already putting creatures on top of your library with Runo. And, creature, but yeah. Yeah, sorry. At the beginning of each end step, if there are three or more quest counters, then you may put a Kraken, a Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. That's cool. There's other stuff like Whelming Wave, two blue blue re for a sorcery, return all creatures to their owner's hand except Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses, and Serpents. And then so if you if you flipped Runo, then it, it you know, uh, and it's Krothis, it won't get bounced with Right, right, because Runo is a vampire cleric. Yeah. And then, hey, speaking of six mana value cards, Serpent of Yawning Depths, you could throw this on top of your library, and it says Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses, and Serpents. We just say K-L-O-S, Kloss. You control can't be blocked except by Colossus. <laughs> sea creatures. Sea creatures, yeah, sea creatures. Sea creatures, not counting Sea monsters. Up. Sea monsters, there we go. 
Kraken is a Vipens, Octopus is Serpent, whatever. So we're going to call them sea, sea creatures for now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could use Masco Nexus or Arcane Abad Adaptation to turn all everything in your deck into, mm. you know, Kraken, Leviathan, whichever one of those you want to choose. Changelings, yeah. So that you can get um, double tokens once it's Krothis on, like, really powerful cards. Like, imagine Agent of Treachery. Oh, my You make gosh. two token copies of it. Yeah, because Masco Nexus, Nexus makes it a Changeling. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. I mean, of course, for the token thing's the exciting part, right? Like, hey, I attack, I get to make yeah. tokens. But you you don't get to just do that. You have to jump through, through some hoops. You have to flip Runo first. On in, on your upkeep as well. So, and, and he helps you mm-hmm. by putting things on top of your library. But you have to have a big creature in your graveyard for that to really work out. So, you know, I think the deck is going to have to have some cards dedicated to, like, flipping Runo, right? Yeah, so Scroll Rack is the easiest way to get cards from your hand back on top of your library. Put that six mana spell on there. Sensei's Divining Top, another great way to reorganize. Brainstorm, again, similar to Scroll Rack a little bit. Yep. Um, but I think Runo's a little interesting because it's a three mana commander, but you want to be able to start flipping it on turn three or four by the time you cast it, but it's hard to also get the stuff into your graveyard in time to have them flip. That's why I think top deck manipulation is better than self-mill. Yeah. Because yeah, self-mill, totally. it's randomly, you don't know what you're going to get in there, and you're you're really only going to have a couple turns to try and do that. Like, you have turn one and turn two, mm-hmm. try and get something in your graveyard, then turn three, Ru- Runo comes out. If there's not a six CMC spell in your graveyard creature, then you won't be able to do this. But whereas if you cast top scroll rack brainstorm and some of that will even work if you cast it brainstorm specifically yeah if you cast it in response to the trigger on turn four right 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 um so that stuff's i think the best way but there's that stuff is expensive like yeah those are not cheap cards and also there's not a ton of that stuff because it's been historically very powerful in magic rock especially yeah so and you will have to do some amount of you know self milling or filling the yard in other ways yeah frantic search is a great one at instant speed uh you also have intuition we mentioned earlier so you can just grab three things and no matter what the opponents put into your graveyard you're going to have the right thing in there factor fiction is a pretty good one again mm-hmm. you could on turn four well no you have to play your land so that wouldn't work yeah um, buried alive allows you to choose what you want to go in there uh just looting and surveil just kind of work right merfolk looter might go in this deck because on turn two you play it turn three runo and then you activate put the card in there right. for runo's trigger yeah, or sorry yeah, yeah. i guess you do that before you, before play runo. you cast runo yeah yeah uh, I like this one, and, and a couple of members of our team came up with it, uh, which is you could cycle. Yeah. You could use cards with cycling, and there are actually a number of serpents or, or leviathans or whatever, sea creatures, that have cycling on them and are 6 CMC or more. So. Yeah. Striped River Winder, River Serpent. These are sea creatures that cost at least six mana, but have cycling for one mana. So you pay a blue, discard them, draw a card, and they've replaced themselves and put something big in your graveyard for Runa to put on top of your library. That's really cool, actually. I like yeah. that a lot. The only thing that's interesting is that when you want Krothis to be attacking with other creatures. However, putting those cards on top of your library and flipping Runo means that you have to have that creature already hasted out or ready to attack that same turn. So when Krothis flips and you have nothing on the board, then it's like, cool, look at this sweet 3-5 that everyone is going to want to immediately kill. That's really you're interesting. play another creature. So you don't even want to play Runo on turn three necessarily sometimes. I think you want to build a board. I think you're actually, now that you say that, I think you probably have like a two CMC, a bunch of two CMC stuff that is at least decent, that has some amount, Champion of Wits or whatever that has some, no, that's three CMC. What's the other one that kind of, whatever. There's some blue <laughs> creatures that do some stuff like- uh, On the of, field. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have a bunch of ponders, brainstorms and stuff, and you're hoping to scry something to the top. Right. That uh, that's going to be really tough to do. You need brainstorm, really. Yeah. It, yeah. It, that's a really good point. It is very hard, I think, on turn four for you to attack with your recently flipped Krothos and get any value off mm-hmm. of it. Because what are you attacking with that he's going to make a token copy of? A one your or Merfolk two looter? Mana. Yeah. And great. Good job. You made two Merfolk looters. Broken. <laughs> Broken. So I think you're. At, I think this deck definitely wants Swiftfoot Boots or, or Lightning Greaves just so you can give something haste as well and get, you know, because like I think later on in the game is when you're going to want to be able uh, to. Greaves is pretty good, right? Because yeah. on turn two, you play that. Runo flips on turn four. You and now you. It. And now he's flipped and you go, okay, play a, th- a four drop, uh, play a something, right? And Instant boots it up. Haste. Now I, uh, now Krothis gets the thing. Yeah. It doesn't say target because you can't target with boots, right? Oh, you're right. So Greaves is even yes, worse. Yes, you can't do Greaves so because you, it targets. So you want to do boots, boots. yeah. Yeah. Okay, jeez. This, the setup is tough uh, to get to, but I think once you get there, the payoff is pretty good. You're not getting attack triggers. It's f- similar to Kalia and all those cards we talked about. So you're going to want to have those ETBs then. Yeah, remember, this is similar to Olivia, yeah, where that attack trigger will not go off. Um, yeah, so ETBs is a big thing. I mean, I put down here, 
Do you even go with sea creatures? I mean, you do get two of them rather than one token, but most sea creatures are not that great. They're just like five fives and six sixes, maybe with hexproof or something. Yeah, you're playing sea creatures because of whelming wave and stuff. I think of anything you're doing the well, mask with nexus route. You're playing them because you get two tokens rather than just one. Yeah, but unless they have great enter the battlefield abilities, then you're wouldn't just make- you rather just have a mole drifter? Probably like one mole drifter better than two. Yeah, you no know, five or, fives or yeah two rune scar demons. Two Instead ravenous of, chupacabras. Yeah, chupacabra. <laughs> I, think, I would. Ra- uh, sorry, one ravenous chupacabra. chupacabra. But also, you have arcane adaptation, mass with nexus. You might have some other ways to change those into. Yeah, I don't know. I think if I were building the deck, and you know, I'm I'm admittedly not like a huge flavor of Orthos player, so I realize some people like that, and that's totally cool. Um, but I think I would probably build it with just generic creatures that i'm going to make token copies of rather than sea creatures yeah you would play arcane adaptation mask with nexus to get potentially but like i think to get three agent of treacheries out yeah, of uh, good. that kind of stuff yeah. otherwise again they're all really high cmc spells the kraken leviathan octopus you gotta get them out there you gotta be swinging with them like it seems yeah. hard it seems hard i think blue and black isn't great at ramping isn't great at doing like sneak attack type stuff so reanimating might be your option here as well oh uh, that's getting a lot of stuff getting stuff out early maybe maybe that's how you yeah, trigger process dead, you have animate dead on turn two instead of something else but you also have to just make sure that you're able to flip it so there's like three things you need to do in order to get the value otherwise i think it's really feel bad if you just flip the crothis and you just attack with a three five flyer and everyone looks at you and goes um is anyone gonna we should do something about that before it gets out of control you do that classic turn one play of just like don't play a land draw for turn go to eight <laughs> discard. cards discard and then play my first line on turn two yeah tell everyone what you're gonna be reanimating they're gonna love to see that seems like a lot of hoops uh it's it's cool design but because you have to get it flipped before you even start doing your thing imagine yeah. it now dies oh boy i gotta play it get it flipped again like it's it's just a lot of hoops yeah i think you put this in the garuda deck you put this in the sea monsters deck runo looks to be a bit tough to make flow the exact way you want to just by itself it may be better in the 99 but it's pretty powerful in those decks once it is there once it's going yeah making two co- or w- even one token copy of something for free is pretty, is pretty and good. they stick around so yeah. we can't forget that so runo is powerful it just seems hard to get there all right two to go the next one is Torrens Fist of Angels. And I want to say uh, in the Dracula reskin version it is Dr. John Seward, mm. who runs the uh, Insane Asylum. I'm pretty sure. Oh, boy. Okay. Sorry if I got that wrong. He seems absolutely input. He in definitely perturbable. talks like this. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. <laughs> oh, wait, that's someone else talking about him. Yeah, nah, talking about him. It. Yeah. All right, whatever. Maybe they all talk like that. Okay. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Back then, it seems like it. Aha! Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tor- Old timey <laughs> talk is great. All right. Torrens, Fist of the Angels. One, a green and a white for a 2-2. Two, two. Legendary human cleric has training. So whenever this creature attacks with another creature with greater power, put a 1-1 counter on this creature. So if a 3-3 three, three or bigger attacks with it, Torrens will get a 1-1 one, one counter. Woohoo! Whenever you cast a creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one green and white human soldier creature token with training. Oh, so it's a 1-1, one, one, Torrent's a 2-2. Two, two. That creature's going to grow when it attacks with him. Yeah. Uh, training's a pretty big game on the tokens, I think. For sure. They and all, it's on yeah. attack, so you can even swing in, and it becomes a 2-2 two, two before it gets blocked or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not... It's not a super, like, revolutionary thing for green and white to, like, m- care about tokens and go yeah, wide strategies. Wide, yeah. yeah, like, this is a very, very, very established archetype in these colors. The only little wrinkle here is that... It cares specifically about creature spells. Spells, yeah. Not necessarily even human spells like Sigarda, uh, that Voxy play on Game Nights. Yeah, so I, there's not a lot to say here. I think the 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 one really powerful thing about Torns is that if you could cast infinite creature spells, you can make infinite one ones with training, and there are some ways to do that. A classic way is Green Belt, Rampager, and uh, Tangle Root. Yep, so Green Belt, Rampager is a green for a 3-4, but you have to pay energy, otherwise you return it to its hand and you get an energy. So you can pay one green to cast it, but it instantly bounces itself, and Tangle Root adds a green mana whenever a player crafts a creature spell to their mana pool. So you can just replay the Green Belt, Rampager a million times, make a million one ones with Torrens. Yeah, and Tangle Root says whenever a player... Uh, cast a creature spell that player adds green mana to their mana pool so that gives you the mana to just keep casting the um the green belt uh rampager affects the whole table yep um also white just has some stuff that will allow you to play and bounce other creatures or 
often bounce itself. So white main line is one mm-hmm. in white for a two two mm-hmm. with flash, and it says when it enters the battlefield, return a creature you control to its owner's hand. You can target itself. So if you have enough mana at the end of turn, you can just be like, I cast white main line seven times. Flash, Make, flash, flash. Yeah, yeah. So that's not necessarily infinite, but it is a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then of course you're going to play your token things, parallel lives, doubling season, all that good stuff, annoying the procession, Bella, retreat. That's a Ooh. good sort of new one. Yada yeah, yada yada. Great. I mean, look, you're just going to make a huge army and swing out with it. Crater Hoof Behemoth, everybody. Base, Beastmaster Ascension. <laughs> we know the ending of this story because we've heard it so many times. Yeah, so. I think I would play Torrens in that cigar deck that Voxy had, though. that Because it's all about it humans, humans, makes yeah. more humans, makes a big army, and then you have so many different ways uh, to add plus and plus and counters to all of them and swing out for all that damage. Seems pretty powerful. Oh, and another good one is Hamza, Guardian of a Ration. It's four, a green, and a white for a 5-5 five, five Elephant Warrior. This spell costs one less to cast for each creature you control with a 1-1 one, one counter on it, so it's obviously going to be a lot cheaper to cast but also it says creature spells you cast cost one less to cast for each creature you control with a one one counter on it and remember torrens makes tokens that have training so they're likely to get plus one plus one counters on their own so this will just make the creature spells you cast to make even more tokens cheaper and cheaper which seems pretty good yeah i think it can be strong i just yeah it's just not necessarily new yeah but that's okay yeah, yeah. it's not everybody's player. built that deck yet so yeah exactly you know, give it a shot and don't forget all of these cards can put be put in other decks that fit those colors they don't have to be your commander all right the last one which if it's in there, it's actually this is probably good in the 99 of some decks, but it's going to be really good as a commander, too. Oh, it's, yeah, it's Toxril the Corrosive five black, black, so seven mana for a seven, seven slug horror at the beginning of each end step. Put a slime counter on each creature you don't control. Whoa, each end step, my end step, Jimmy's end step, Mel's end step, Ashlyn's end step. That's four slime counters. Things are about to get real slimy up in here. Creatures you don't control get negative one, negative one for each slime counter on them. <laughs> each That means each rotation in a four-player game, every single creature you don't control gets, a, gets minus four, minus four. I mean, that's crazy. Just that, right? Yeah. Like, that's pretty brutal. Whenever a creature you don't control with a slime counter on it dies... Create a 1-1 one, one black slug creature token. Okay, so you may be even creating five, six, seven slug tokens at the end of that turn cycle. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's pretty crazy because your opponents know this is your commander when they get into the game with you. So yeah. they're hopefully they're being a little more careful than that, but you're probably getting some. And then also, because that was not enough <laughs> abilities, I mean, it is a seven uh, mana value spell. You, It also has an activated ability. You can pay a blue and a black. So this is a two-color commander, Demir. Mm-hmm. Pay a blue and a black, sacrifice a slug to draw a card. So remember, you make 1-1 one, one slugs when creatures with slime counters dies, and then you can sack those slugs and turn them into cards. Yeah. Um, and it gives another color to the commander, too. This actually reminds me quite a bit of Coma, in that, mm-hmm. it, not that it does the same thing, but what Coma does is so good that your strategy kind of should probably become get Coma out. Yeah. And then just leave Coma. Get, you don't have to have any other strategy that's going to advance the game in any way. You only are concentrated. Coma stays alive. Yep. Correct. Coma. Because Toxreal will do most of the work. Now, it won't be great against non-creature decks. That's the one thing I will say. Mm-hmm. But most non-creature decks want their commander out. And Toxreal is not going to allow that because most of those commanders are like, you know, tutus. Yeah. And the hard thing about it is that it's at your end step. So like you pass turn to me, you've just played Toxreal. I go, well, I'm not going to play anything this turn because I'm right after you. It's going to get minus three, minus three by the time it gets back to your turn. I guess I just sit here and don't do anything. I have so to it's kill Toxreal or just play non-creature stuff. Yeah. It's almost like a stasis kind of effect because it stops people from doing something that they would normally be doing. There's a another pretty mean thing you can do um, with the card Cormus Bell, which is a four mana art artifact it says all swamps are one one creatures that are still lands that's bad uh if you know you're playing a demir deck you're probably also going to have urborg in your deck so if you play this with urborg out and toxrel out of course uh and pass the turn uh all of your opponent's lands are going to be swamps and then they're all going to get negative one negative one and then also you know that's going to kill all their lands and then also it's going to make you a bunch of slugs which is, I guess, kind of the good part of this combo because then at least you have a quick way to win from there. Because let me tell you from experience, um, if you destroy all your opponent's lands sure, and you don't win very quickly, they're going to be a little salty about it. They might be salty about it anyways. Uh, but that, you know, obviously any way to turn your opponent's uh, lands into creatures will result in um, <laughs> some pretty <laughs> some pretty salty opponents, but also probably you winning the game. 
it, it seems very strong. We're going to go through some stuff you can do with it, obviously. I think you can stack the triggers, get more than one trigger. You can strionic resonator, lithoform engine it. Just one end step, though. That might not be worth it. Yeah. Um, you can do clones, though, that copy legendaries, and that is worth it because now all of a sudden you're getting negative eight, negative eight around the table. And you're getting twice as many slugs, too, because you're both the yes. toxins will trigger. So Sakashima the Imposter and Sakashima of a Thousand Faces both allow you to copy. Uh, Spark Double, as well, allows you to copy and make it non-legendary. So Does this sound like coma yet? Yeah, this are these. I mean, this is insane. You can make so. Here's the thing: people shouldn't be playing a lot of creatures out, but if they end up doing it anyway, or let's just say they're a, a freaking uh, yeah, they're deck, deck or something. What yeah, they do? Not, not do their thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're trying to kill you beforehand, but just playing Toxeril out or even getting it out, it's it slows down the entire table. You're gonna definitely make at least a couple of slugs, and if you run out of gas, you can sack the slugs to draw more cards. Pretty good. There's only one other card in the history of Magic that that does slime counters. Yeah. And that is uh, Sludge Monster. Oh, Sludge Monster. I didn't pull this one up. Let me bring it up. It's pretty funny, and it's pretty recent, too. But because slime counters are what Toxtral puts on, it will work with Sludge Monster. And it actually, right, like... Midnight Hunt, that's right. Yeah, and it actually, like, vastly accelerates how bad this is for your opponent. So you want to read Sludge Monster? Yeah, it's a 5-5 five, five for three blue-blue. Whenever Sludge Monster enters the battlefield or attacks, put a slime counter on up to one other target creature, and non-horror creatures with slime counters on them lose all abilities and have base power and toughness 2-2. Two, two. So, so if you have Sludge Monster out and it's only put one slime counter on one thing, but then you play Toxrill? Yeah, they instantly get minus two minus two on your end step because you're going to put a slime counter on them and they all become they're all two twos yeah they get minus one minus one still but now they're one ones with no abilities yeah and they'll die on your end the next person's end step. right because they all literally so toxer only needs two end steps to kill everything because the moment a slime counter gets put on the creature they become a two two and they lose all their abilities so they can't even use them anymore and now you just really cannot play creatures in that game because yeah, they're kind of like die humility in, almost yeah it kills everything every two upkeeps yeah it's it that's pretty nuts but it's only opponent's control remember slime counters don't go on your stuff and even if they did it says only creatures you don't control get the negative one negative one right so it's just you know you're protected from it i think also like when the creatures die and you get the um, the tokens from Toxtrail, it doesn't actually care if the negative negative whatever is what killed them. It just cares did they have did a they slime die, counter right. when they died. So you can also still play in Garrick's Wake and Plague, Plague Winds. Wind. Toxic Deluge gets so good, right? Because <laughs> because people might have four fours and stuff, right? But that means you shrunk them by the time it comes back to you. Yeah, and saying a two two. One, so I just Toxic Deluge for two, mm. and everything dies. And you might. They might have a plan, like, okay, I'm going to play this, I'm going to play this, it won't quite die, and then I'll be able to do this other thing, and you just screw up with their plan by I Toxic Deluge for two. And, and your stuff doesn't die now because, yeah, you know, you didn't have negative one, negative one on every, all your stuff. Or Heck, negative as three. long as you do below seven, which is what Toxrel is at, you're going you're to almost to get, yeah, you're definitely good to go, and you're going to get a lot of creatures dead, make a lot of little sluggies, too. Even just regular removal will work good, you know, they yeah. figure they're safe and they're going to deal with it you know and then you go well i'll still get my slug and kill your thing slug tribal is a question that i think probably you kind of got to ask just because you know yeah, it cares about sacrifice slugs. the slug draw a card there are only five slugs in blue black in the history bad. of magic and they're all really bad so that that's not a thing but masswood nexus arcane adaptation the card conspiracy we've yeah, been mentioning them a lot the colors to do it in that turns every creature you play in the deck into a uh, potential card draw and a, a way to get value a sack outlet on mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, you're you're going to just be getting slugs by killing other creatures. Once Toxtro comes out, though, I think the only downside is that after it passes the turn rotation, if someone hasn't killed it, people are just going to stop playing creatures. Right. They'll just pass and then figure out, okay, there's going to be some kind of removal, some kind of board wipe for you. So Toxtro, you, you definitely want to protect it. But I think after that first turn rotation kind of has done its thing. And it's killed almost everything on the board. But that's probably fine as long as from that point forward you have enough counter spells and protection for it. Yeah. And then they just might not be able to beat it. You're going to run your Fierce Guardianships and your Lazotep Platings and stuff, right? And then it's just like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. you know, fine. Don't play anything, but you're also you're going to die that way too. Yeah, I have a 7-7 seven, seven that can yeah. kill you in three hits. Uh, you made a category I like called Slugfest. Slugfest, yeah. It, this deck is its own win condition. You're getting everything minus four, minus four by the first time you play it. You have some army of slugs, and then you can go aristocrats. You can sack them all. You can play meat hook massacre type effects. You can play blood artists, all that good stuff. And you have now card draw, pinging. If you have like an Eloise Nefelia Sleuth, it makes it just a ton of tokens. And, and every time a creature, and uh, you sack a token, clues. you surveil one. So you're also sacrificing the slug token so you're surveilling one each time so there's just like a lot of different ways to just go off um with this but it is a seven oh pillars plunderer as well 
you're just going to be creating your every slugs. time you slack slug yeah. make a treasure so i think you're just you, you just have a ton of value the value is endless one thing here because it's a very powerful card uh to warn people about is it is a seven mana value seven cmc commander mm-hmm. so this card is going to be really tough to to stay on the board everyone's going to want to kill it first because it will turn off most decks yeah so you are going to want to run ways to get it out a little bit early Dark Ritual, High Tides, maybe even play Jeweled Lotus in this deck. Oh, definitely play Jeweled Lotus. Uh, Kirik, you put down, is really smart. Um, and you don't want to play Commander Techs on this thing, so you're probably going to run Recursion and just let it go to the graveyard, animate yeah. dead, reanimate. Uh, and then, like we said, a lot of protection for it. I've seen Comadex. This is going to feel a lot similar to Comadex. I think Comadex can also be not fun for the person who built the coma deck because it goes one of two ways. Yeah. Either coma gets out, sticks on the board and you win or the table never lets you get coma out and your deck does nothing. And <laughs> those are kind of the two, the two, you know, choices on the path. And I think talk show has a chance to sort of feel like that. So just be a little bit careful as I'm saying, I think it can be a very powerful deck, but it's going to be one that your opponents grown at. Yes. Because it just, it will feel to them like the... You're just shutting down the game. Yeah. In a lot of different ways. Like, yeah. hey, all my deck wants, everything my deck wants to do is based on creatures. And once that's out, it feels worse than Elish Norn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Toxro refills your hand. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It feels worse than Elish Norn. Doesn't... Uh, I think for a lot of decks, it will. Don't don't hear that every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And we've got one more commander to talk about. <laughs> and uh, the observant among you might notice that Jimmy and I are wearing different clothes. And I got a haircut. Because Magic this uh, next... Um, legendary creature is only available in the set boosters, similar to how Lindy was for mm-hmm. Midnight Hunt. And once again, we missed it on the first pass. But we're back here. We're, we're being thorough. So uh, this is what we call a pickup in the industry. All right, Jimmy, you want to read? Right. Let's pick it up with Umbris Fear Manifest. It's three of blue and a black for a 1-1 one, one legendary creature, Nightmare Horror. Umbris gets plus one, plus one for each card your opponents own in exile. Whenever Umbris or another Nightmare or Horror enters the battlefield under your control, target opponent, target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a land card. Okay. So this is Horror, Nightmare, Tribal, but also yes. cares about your opponents having things exiled. Yep, and those two things are not tied together. Uh, it's only when the Umbris, Nightmare, or Horror enters the battlefield, then your opponent's mill, but you can mill them other ways and have those cards in exile to give Umbris plus one, plus one. Well, yeah, and when you play Nightmares or Horrors, they also will do the yeah. mill thing until they hit a land. So, you know, if you have a bunch of Nightmares and Horrors in your deck, you're going to be mill... It's not really milling, right? What do we call it when you mill to exile? Mill to exile. That's what exactly what we call it. Mexile. <laughs> Mexile. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you make them do that, then Umbers will obviously get bigger. So that's kind of your payoff for exiling their things. And also, like, if you play enough Nightmares and Horrors, you could just completely Mexile them out. Yeah, and here's the thing. Umbris is going to be really big for it's each card your opponents own in exile. So you count all three of your opponents. Let's say for some reason everyone has 15 cards exiled. Umbris gets plus 45, plus 45. And will be your commander, you know, and in the, in the, in how we're talking about it here. So really that's just one hit dead. Yeah, which may not happen. Bloom Black is known for unblockable type stuff, and there's a way to do that. I don't know. I mean, this is a weird card because typically you're not playing Voltron type stuff in commander. And this is also saying be Nightmare Horror Tribal. So I think this deck, if anything, is more about exiling stuff off your opponent's library and denying them stuff, combo pieces, whatever in their deck. So this reads more control than necessarily hit them with one shot. I do think, though, you're probably going to play a couple of, like, Rogue's Passage and oh, yeah. Aqua's Form, maybe. Like, a couple of one-off, hey... Jump? <laughs> I could <laughs> just... I could just Yeah, maybe something like that that's just like, hey, I could just get somebody out of nowhere this way. Because once you've got your opponent's cards in exile, yeah, not a lot they can do. There's not a lot of cards that bring things back from exile, especially not a lot of things. You might be able to get one or two of them mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. So once it's big, it's going to be big. And if you have, like, a Swift Foot Boots out and a jump in your hands, you can just get people out of nowhere, maybe. You may not even need to kill them with commander damage because when Umbra is a 61 61 they're, they're just almost dead die. already <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah they're just they're gonna get one shot out yeah exactly uh so nightmare horror tribal if you're gonna want to you know be exiling a lot of cards from your opponent's library you're gonna want to play enough nightmares and horrors so that they're continuously milling mm-hmm. and there are i looked it up there are 40 nightmares okay in these colors in the history of magic which is not that many but there are 161 
horrors. Huh. And then there are some um, cards that make horror tokens mm-hmm. and less that make nightmare tokens, although there are a few. Um, let's talk about a couple key ones we think are definitely going to go in this stack. The first one is kind of a, a used to be a commander staple type card. It was. They put in commander products. I remember thinking that this would be the most powerful thing on the board when I first played it and it quickly became not. But now with Umbris here, maybe it is. It's consuming apparition. It is three, a blue, and a black for a star star creature horror. When it's uh, consuming apparitions, power and toughness are each equal to the number of cards in your opponent's graveyards. Whenever you cast a spell, each opponent reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a land card and then put those cards into their graveyard. Now, important to note, consuming apparition seems to be counter synergy with Umbris. However... Uh, because it's milling things into the graveyard, it's actually easier to get things from graveyard into exile in sort of uh, a mass way, and we'll talk about that in a second, than often it is to sort of one by one get rid of things off the battlefield or yeah. off or, or mexile them. Um, so consuming apparition is also a horror, so it is going to do the umbrous mill thing when it comes in, and then it'll do, well, I guess you can stack those triggers however you want. Um, right. Then it'll do its thing where it mills into the graveyard. That could get a little confusing, I suppose. But for casting a spell, you do that each time. So I think if you're going to go the mill plan, then Consuming Aberration looks a lot better as well. Um, there's also a Nightmare Shepherd, which uh, I think I, I wish I saw this card more. It seems really powerful. Two black black for a 4-4 four, four Flyer Demon. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you may exile it. And if you do, you create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's 1-1 one, one, and it's a Nightmare and instead of its other type. So this rebuys pretty much any non-token creature you control dying into a Nightmare, which would then trigger Umbris, and you just go off. Think and, about Consuming Aberration with this, right? Like, you oh, know, yeah. you've cast a Nightmare spell, so they're going to do the mill thing. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you sacrifice the Consuming Aberration. On one one version of it comes in, it's a Nightmare, mills him for Umbris, mills him for being a Consuming Aberration. Yeah. You know, this could be a nice little um, loop to get into. You definitely can just start milling and ex- exiling everyone's libraries. And I think that's what the deck is powerful at. Is I, I, would, I could see with this deck by turn five or six, half of everyone's deck is just gone either in their graveyard or in exile. The exile plan's really powerful too because you can just happen to get rid of key pieces from their deck especially mm-hmm. like combo decks can just be totally hosed um because if they've got a certain win con that's tied to a combo and you just happen to mexile it away i love how mexile is just a thing now it is it is <laughs> menache mexile mexile <laughs> mexile that's it's, it's, that's it's two steps yeah. yeah 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 people get actually angry about that one um so let's talk about the mill to exile strategy because we alluded to it a second ago. Um, it's a lot easier to get a bunch of your opponent's cards into exile from their graveyard because there yeah. are, are a bunch of effects that just exile graveyards. Mm-hmm. So there's Tormod's Crypt, which is a zero mana artifact. You tap it and sacrifice it to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. Leyland of the Void. This is a commander staple because you might be able to play it for free at the beginning of the game if it's in your hand. But more importantly, if a card would be put into an opponent's library from graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So milling, discard, graveyard, uh, battlefield, anything, it just gets exiled which is great for Umbris. Uh, Phyrexian Scriptures is a saga from recent years in enchantments. Um, it's, it's third chapter. I'm not going to read the other two chapters is exile all cards from all opponents graveyards. Mm. So this usually, the fact that it's the third chapter is not that big a deal because you want a little bit of time to get some things into your opponent's graveyards. Yeah. So, you know, with consuming apparition and other things and just the normal course of events in commander games, there's usually one graveyard deck. Often by the time it hits chapter three, it's going to go boom and get, 20 or 30 cards into exile there. And importantly, this is always opponent's graveyards. Uh, yep. Rarely is it your own graveyard. So that means you could run stuff like Wonder, throw that into your graveyard, and then give Umbris that flying to then just one-shot someone. Here's a card that I mentioned on Twitter recently, and I know you're a big fan, Jimmy, that oh, yeah. I've just been putting into basically like every black deck now. It's kind of like a Jessica's Will, but for black. It's secretly like one of the best cards from like the last couple of years. Maybe not so much a secret anymore. Not a secret to me. I saw this thing and was, my mind was just straight went to, hold on, why? And there's more t- And there's more text? Yeah, this is a very push it. card. It's Delthy Voidwalker. It's black, black for a 3-2 Delthy Rogue. Has shadow, which means this creature can block or be blocked only by creatures with shadow. But it says, if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, instead exile it with a void counter on it. Oh. And then you can tap and sacrifice the Delthy Voidwalker. Choose an exiled card an opponent owns with a void counter on it. You may play it this turn without paying its mana cost. Wow. So just crazy things going on. Just on its base, it just sits there and hoses graveyards, puts things into exile for you. And then also, if you just happen to exile something insane... Expropriate. You get to cast it for free. (laughs) Yeah. And not just that... Dalthy Voidwalker just gets sacrificed. So you could reanimate this thing yep. and those void counters, it doesn't care what version of Dalthy Voidwalker is on the battlefield. It will still be able to see them. 
Yeah. Um, some other ways to exile stuff. All the Ashioks really mm-hmm. do it. So Ashiok Nightmare Muse, Ashiok De- Dream Render, Ashiok Nightmare Weaver. I think Dream Render might be the best here because you can just play it for one and then Demir Demir and then just minus one it to make a player mill four cards but then you exile each opponent's graveyard so you just go boom you mill four cards then all graveyards gone and now you can just sit there and if they can't kill the ashiok you'll just be i'll just wait till more stuff's in there and do it again yeah you can do it up to four times or five times technically before ashiok dies that version yep ashiok nightmare muse makes nightmare tokens that yeah. also mexile people so oh yeah the nightmare tokens entering the battlefield will do it and then when they attack or block each opponent exiles the top two cards of the library so that just keeps it going yeah so ashiok definitely on this plan there's a cool card called Cirque Demir Lobot- Lobotomist. <laughs> it's a, a creature that costs four mana. Whenever you cast a blue spell, exile the top card of target player's library. Whenever you cast a black spell, exile the top card of target player's library. Mm. And then it says your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as a card exile with Circa, which is not the biggest of deals unless you get somebody's soul ring or something. Or they get any of your decks with a bunch of the same card. That's true. <laughs> Dragon's Approach or something. That'd yeah. be brutal. Uh, but it's just whenever you cast spells, you're exiling cards and yeah. Umbris is getting bigger. Uh, the classic Una Queen of the Fey is a blue-black commander that just you can pay X and then blue and uh, blue or black to choose a color, and then the target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library, and then for each uh, card exiled of the chosen color, you get to make a 1-1 black and blue fairy rogue creature token with flying, but more importantly, this can just turbo mill people, or turbo mexile people in this case, uh, for X. Makes Umbris really hard to block, too, because you can do that at instant speed, and oh, then, yeah. if you just got the mana open, you're like, hey, uh, I could X equals 12, I'm definitely going to get 12 cards off your <laughs> library. Yeah, uh, some cool stuff going on. Here's an interesting one, and I have a question mark by it. Like, do you run this? Crumbling Sanctuary, okay. five mana for an artifact. If damage would be dealt to a player, that player exiles that many cards from the top of their library instead. Ooh. That's a player. So nobody's dealing damage to each other anymore. It's just exiling that many cards off yeah, their library. Yeah, changes the fundamental rules of the game. <laughs> uh, I think this is, I mean, I think if you're going the one-shot Umbris build, this is good. Uh, or if you're going the pure control mill everyone out strategy, this is good. It might cause people to just be like, well, let's kill that person. Yeah, then... yeah, yeah. Why am I going to deal damage to you? You're going to exile those cards. Let's just kill the person that's doing this. But then they have to mill you out unless they get rid of the it's current treasure. Point, actually. They, can't they have just to kill you. exile you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, a, that's like a coin flip depending on how you take the deck. Uh, and then there are some exile payoffs. Uh, not a ton in the history of Magic. We're just going to mention a couple. But there are some cards that kind of reward you for having your opponent's stuff in exile. Oblivion Sour oh, I love this feels card. insane in this deck. So uh, this is a six mana Eldrazi. It's a five eight. But it says when you cast this spell, target opponent exiles the top four cards of their library. Then you may put any number of land cards that player owns from exile onto the battlefield under your control. Wow. So remember, if you've been already mexiling them with umbris and you know with tormod's crypt or whatever they might have a ton of lands already in there not just the four that oblivion mm-hmm. so or and then you might get like seven eight ten lands like that's a huge game they also come in untapped it's crazy. very importantly i play this in my paco and Haldan deck because you're always exiling cards at the top of your library but this umbris deck is doing so at a much faster pace i mean if someone has 60 cards of their library in their exile zone or their exile their exile zone that's just the exile yeah, zone that's just the exile zone <laughs> then you're going to get like 20 lands. <laughs> so crazy. Just off that one player. Yeah. So pretty crazy. Uh, and then there's like Wasteland Strangler. There's a bunch of cards kind of like this. Uh, I guess we can read this one. Yeah, it's a two and a black for a three, two with Devoid. So the card has no color technically. And when Wasteland Strangler enters the battlefield, you may put a card an opponent owns from exile into that player's graveyard. So what is this? Uh, exile, Exalard? No, this is the way. processing. I think processing, that's what they call yeah. when you bring it back. And if you do, target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. So this is just a nice removal spell, but this will always have a target in the deck like this. And if you can flicker, bounce, uh, Nightmare Shepherd, bring it back you can do this to a lot of different creatures and sort of kill off problematic things on the board and there's a bunch of processors that kind of do little things yeah. so you can use those cards in exile from your opponents and you can pick ones that maybe don't matter that much and you know okay that can go back in your graveyard yeah, yeah, this yeah. effect yeah yeah pretty so good stuff umbra seems interesting i don't think it'll be crazy powerful but it feels like horrors and nightmares will get a little bit more play in it and this is going to do some stuff and definitely going to knock some people out of the game out of nowhere yeah yeah and we've seen that wizards is printing more horrors they had mind flare in adventures of the forgotten realm so i think this is a creature type that we're probably gonna see more of and this also takes blue and black in a way that's a little different it's still kind of milly graveyard stuff but in this case, it could also just be one-shot commander, which we haven't seen very much of. Yeah, and because it's playing with the Exile, I think it gives you a little more uh, tools that maybe you wouldn't use in the mill decks. So that's cool. 
All right, let's go back to before we came to the pickup, back into the regular clothes from before, or what, I don't know. Regular clothes. We're wearing different clothes. All right, that is going to wrap it up for all of our commanders that we're talking about. Now we got to do something really fun, and this is a question we also asked you, the audience, but we got to talk about the most powerful pick and the most favorite pick between us. Yeah, so just among the multicolored commanders from Crimson Vow that we talked about today, just the main set again, uh, we are going to go through and say what we think is the most powerful, and then which is our favorite. So let's do most powerful first, Jimmy. Okay. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Toxrail. Ah, okay. Well, I think Toxrail is the most powerful just... We just talked about it for five minutes. You all know the reasons. I just think it's a great shutdown commander. The only downside is the seven mana, but this will be effective against you know ninety percent of the commander decks. Yeah, and I think Toxtro is probably the most powerful commander at like casual tables, right? So oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is going to be a card that a lot of people have a lot of trouble dealing with. Um, it's seven CMC, so I think if built to its most powerful and Grolnock built to its most powerful, Grolnock is going to be more powerful because. Toxrel won't even get cast in the game before yeah. Gronach. Gronach's just going to combo off of the Hermit Druid and win Yeah, instantly. so it just depends on how you define power level. If you define how powerful it is at its, mo- at its most possible power level, then I think it's Gronach. But I agree with you, Toxrel is just... Up eat- there. Well, it's floor. Just play Toxrel. Yeah, play the commander. Don't do anything, <laughs> anything. else. It's going to be very powerful. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be very powerful. <laughs> All right, let's go to personal favorite of these uh, new multicolored commanders. Um, we actually, I'm looking at the paper. We have the same one. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so it's it's no surprise. Go ahead and, and, and... It is Olivia, Crimson Bride. I mean, come on. It's a six mana flyer haste that pops out a huge creature. That's cool. It's not too powerful, I don't think, but it is still very powerful. You can do lots of different directions with this. This card fits into a bunch of pre-existing decks and archetypes. And I love myself a vampire. So it, it matches really well. I mean, I'll definitely play this in my Marchesa deck, I think. I think this goes well in so many different decks that you want to rebuy creatures. And it's just fun. Yeah, cheating out huge stuff out of the graveyard and then getting to keep it for, you know, it's not mm-hmm. like you have to sacrifice it at a turn. seems powerful. And, and you know, it's fitting. Yeah. Olivia is the bride. So as her wedding day present, Jimmy and I have both chosen to choose her as our favorite overall commander. And for her uh, maid of honor, she has chosen a giant Eldrazi (laughs) to bring along to the wedding. (laughs) All right. To the listeners, what new commander that we talked about today are you the most excited to build? What sweet new uh, tech do you have? What stuff did we not mention maybe for that commander? Yes, I would love to hear. That you think is like, you know, a must include in those decks. Please tell us in the comments. Uh, It also helps everybody that's viewing. If If you watch these episodes, it's, pretty smart to go into the comments on youtube and kind of scroll through what other people say because jimmy and i are recording this stuff before edh rec and the world knows about the cards reddit and everything like that Mm -hmm. and so you know every once in a while we might miss an interaction or something like that or people just think of things that nobody else thinks of all the time in magic that's one of the great things about it and and being able to just find those hidden gems down there in the comments is is a really smart way to go it's cool just to see stories and share stories down there too i always end up scrolling through almost most of the comments just to see what other people say especially when we did stuff like the i hate your deck episode yeah really cool to see what everyone else said hate your deck or hate my deck sorry decks i hate built but hate it i hate your deck is something else else. 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 it's a gameplay show but i do hate (laughs) your deck josh (laughs) i hate that talk scroll deck (laughs) big thanks as always to our sponsor channelfireball.com slash command use that promo code at checkout or just when you go to their marketplace to buy any of the cards in magic's history they've got them all you're supporting a local game store these are verified vendors they're going to be shipping it with confidence so that you know you're going to get the cards that you want at the quality you're asking for them and they're also going to be competitive prices because it is a marketplace so everyone is competing with each other to make sure that they get your attention as a buyer yeah great prices great inventory great service i mean that's all the things you want in a magic card vendor you're going to buy that stuff anyway just support all of the content you enjoy while you're doing it. We appreciate everybody that does that. And then once you get all that stuff, make sure you put it into Ultra Pro products. They are the ones that Jimmy and I trust our own collections with, not just because they keep your card safe, which they do better than anybody else, but also because their stuff looks super cool. Look at this Olivia deck yeah. box. As I said, it's got like a leather finish to it. Super high quality. It is going to keep your deck safe. I keep having trouble even opening the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just very, very cool stuff from Ultra Pro. will make your battlefield look awesome. Yep, I love Ultra Pro. I put all of my cards in Ultra Pro binders as well. All right. Yeah, you did that recently, right? Yeah, I did. How, what, how tall is the sack of binders? Because you have a lot of cards. Uh, so they, it goes about the length of this table oh and they're all four, 13 inch by 13 inch binders that have four rows across and I have three for each color 
pretty much because so it's like just, this tall on the table. Oh no, it's like this tall because the binders are this. And if you if you had to stack it up, it would be the height of like I don't know, like a six foot tall person at least. <laughs> so it's a lot of binders. That sounds like a hell of a project. It took me about five months to do so. So I don't think you're going to start anytime soon. I am not doing that. that. Yeah, yeah I do it's not way too long. Friend. Yeah. <laughs> All right. End step. No end step today. This episode is very long already, but we do have some cool end steps coming up. So you know, we'll save those for later. Pay attention. And big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. You want to try and do it in one breath? Uh, I've done it before. You go. No, I did, I've done it before, too. Okay, fine. <gasps> Arthur Meadowcroft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, out for the stock. Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Bridges, Sam Walder, Gaurav Galati, Truck Ty, Jamie Block, Damon Lenz, Shauna Gills, and Evan Limburger. All right. I've still got more breath. I can keep going. Special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for creating the living card animations that live behind us here on set oftentimes. And of course, start our show at youtube.com slash the Command Zone Podcast. You can find them on Twitter at Living Cards MTG. I still got breath going. But All right, everybody, thanks for watching. I have no one as a vampire. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later. Alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>